Madam Chair, we're now live. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our uh, CAP meeting. I just have to read that due to the COVID-19 emergency declaration, this meeting of Community Affairs and Planning Committee has been held electronically and live streamed on the town's website. All members of council are in attendance and are participating by uh, audio and video teleconference and senior town staff are available throughout the meeting if council members have any questions on the agenda. For members of the public watching at home, please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties through this meeting. Uh, I'm gonna call this meeting to order. I just wanna remind everyone, we haven't done a, a CAP public meeting uh, on Zoom for a while. So this uh, being a public meeting, just a reminder to everyone that first staff will make a presentation. Second, council members will have an opportunity to ask uh, questions and receive answers. Thirdly, the public questions and comments, uh, the public will have their opportunity uh, at that time. Fourth, the developer and applicants will be able to make their comments. And fifth, finally, the comments by council members and then the vote will be called. Just so we all know how this, remember how this all works again. Okay, so I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Uh, is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest? Okay, I have a motion uh, that is moved by uh, Grandpa, uh, sorry, I was gonna call you Grandpa, Councillor Tyler Morin, uh, and seconded by uh, Councillor Bauer uh, to accept the meetings, the regular meetings of March the 1st. All in favor or any questions? All in favor? Great, thank you. Okay, so I need you to move up that, at, at the, okay, here we go. All right, so we have a presentation uh, by Director of Planning and Development, uh, Jeff Romanowski on the Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application, Z5-20, Ivanhoe, Cambridge. Hi. Hey, hi. How are you? How's everyone doing this evening? All good, thanks. Uh, I will not be doing the presentation. Uh, Eric Simpson will grace us with his presence this evening. He's the planner on the file Z5 slash 20. So I will turn it over to Eric to run council through this application. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of council, as well as those members of the public who are joining us virtually. My name is Eric Simpson and I'm the planner responsible for processing this development proposal. My presentation will provide a summary of the development proposal and submitted development applications, provide an evaluation of the development proposal and rela related land use planning policy context, and outline and address comments received regarding the development proposal. Please note that this meeting serves as a statutory public meeting for the committee to consider and make a decision on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. The continued review and approval of the site plan application will be completed by staff. The subject lands are located in the southwest corner of Kingston Road East and Audley Road South and extend west to Crothers Creek. The subject lands are within the jurisdictions of the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, TRCA, and the Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority, CLOCA. The western portion of the subject lands within the jurisdiction of TRCA contain the valley corridor associated with Crothers Creek, which contains a regulatory floodplain and contiguous vegetation. Within the jurisdiction of Cloca, along the eastern limits of the subject lands, and within the Audley Road right-of-way, there is a wetland and woodland associated with the tributary of Lindy Creek. The subject lands are located along the eastern boundaries of the town's urban area and are surrounded by the following land uses. To the north is Kingston Road. Along the north side of Kingston Road is Casino Ajax and the Ajax Downs racetrack. Between Alexander's Crossing and Audley Road North are vacant lands designated for employment purposes. To the east is the unopened road allowance of Audley Road South. Across the road allowance are vacant lands within the boundaries of the town's rural area and within the Greenbelt Plan. To the south are vacant lands owned by the Ministry of Transportation and Highway 401. And to the west is Crothers Creek. Further west is a low density residential neighborhood, municipally known as the Grove, Miles Park, and vacant and occupied employment lands. The subject lands have frontage on the Kingston Road, however, they are also bounded by two future road extensions, being the Audley Road extension along the eastern limits and the Chambers Drive extension along the southern limits. Uh, 
The figure on the screen illustrates the development limits and therefore the lands to be developed in green hatching. As you can see, the proposed development encom will encompass only a portion of the subject lands, which consists of the parcel of land municipally known as 537 Kingston Road East and portions of the land to the west. In July 2020, Ivanhoe Cambridge submitted Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Z520 and Site Plan Application SP820 to permit the development of a warehouse distribution center. The Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application proposes to rezone the subject lands to the Prestige Employment Zone and Environmental Protection Zone in accordance with the overarching official plan designations. In addition, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment proposes a site-specific exception for the prestige employment zone in order to establish development standards that would implement the proposed development. The site plan application has been submitted to evaluate, review, and address all technical and functional details of the proposed development. The subject lands are designated prestige employment and environmental protection in the town of Ajax official plan. The western portion of the subject lands containing the valley corridor associated with Crothers Creek and the eastern portion of the subject lands containing a wetland and woodland associated with the tributary of Lindy Creek are designated, designated environmental protection. This is shown in green. The balance of the lands are designated prestige employment, which is shown in blue. The subject lands are also located within area specific policy 6.3 and 6.18, as well as special study area two of the official plan. The subject lands are located along Kingston Road, which is a type B arterial road and a regional corridor. Area specific policy 6.3 regulates a larger area in which the subject lands are located. The policy states that the relocation of the existing tributary of Lindy Creek from the Audley Road right of way will be permitted to the satisfaction of the town and COCA. Area specific policy 618 regulates the northern portion of the subject lands. The intent of this policy is to permit limited retail uses in conjunction with prestige employment uses. However, this policy has been deferred in its entirety by Durham Region and is not applicable as it relates to the development of the subject lands. Special Study Area 2 applies to lands in proximity to Casino Ajax. It states that the town shall conduct a study to determine the feasibility of the development of an entertainment and recreation node. However, it does not preclude the development of a new use permitted with, by the overarching prestige employment designation. Special Study Area 2 is largely correlated with the potential expansion of Casino Ajax that was previously envisioned. Given the recent history of events that have occurred as it relates to Casino Ajax and Durham Live, the town's 2020 Commercial and Employment Land Review Report recommends the removal of Special Study Area 2 to recognize the important role that this employment area plays in attracting future employment growth. The subject lands are currently zoned deferral number one, general employment zone with the holding provision and agricultural zone in the town of Ajax zoning bylaw. Small portions of the subject lands outside of the development limits are currently zoned open space zone and prestige employment zone with a holding provision. The current zoning of the subject lands is not reflective of the overarching official plan designations. In order to bring the subject lands into conformity with the official plan and to permit the development proposal, the applicant is requesting that the zoning bylaw be amended to rezone the subject lands to a prestige employment PE zone and a site with a site specific exception and the environmental protection EP zone. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment would enable the development of employment uses in accordance with the PE zone, which includes a warehouse distribution center and offices, as well as establish site specific development standards to facilitate the proposed development. This includes zoning provisions relating to the location of parking loading spaces and associated truck and trailer storage in order to ensure that an enhanced level of site design is achieved in accordance with official plan policies. The development proposal consists of a one-story warehouse distribution center with an approximate gross floor area of 1.2 million square feet, 100 or alternatively 112,000 square meters. 108 square meters of such gross floor area is proposed for warehouse and distribution use, while 4,760 square meters is proposed for potential office use. The office space is proposed to be located at each corner of the building, two facing Kingston Road and two facing the Future Chambers Drive extension. Three separate vehicle access points are proposed to service the development. A right in right out access along Kingston Road located in the western limits of the development site, 
A signalized full move access at the Kingston Road and Alexander's Crossing intersection located in the middle of the development site and a third access point along the future Aubin Road extension. As the subject lands have exposure to arterial roads, this being Kingston Road, the future Audley Road extension, and the future Chambers Drive extension, as well as Highway 401, the proposed development will need to exhibit a high standard of building and landscaping design in accordance with prestige employment official plan policies and the employment area's urban design guidelines. This requires features such as parking, loading spaces, and truck and trailer storage to be screened from public view. Through the use of different architectural and landscape treatments and designs, the development proposal would adequate, adequately screen parking and loading areas from public view to achieve a prestige appearance. The proposed development addresses key urban design guideline policies and incorporates various sustainable design and site features to provide an overall urban design compatible with the policies of the official plan. For example, offices are proposed to be located at each corner of the building facing the street with adjacent outdoor pedestrian amenity areas. Loading spaces and truck and trailer parking are proposed in the side yards to be screened from Kingston Road and Highway 401. The building design proposes different materials and colors as well as various changes to the roof line. A light colored roofing material is proposed in order to provide a cool roof to assist with the urban heat island effect. Pedestrian connections are proposed from building entrances to parking areas to the street and to the existing bus stop along Kingston Road. Bicycle parking is proposed at building entrances. Tree islands are proposed in the parking lot in addition to a significant amount of tree planting proposed in the various landscape buffers. And lastly, low impact development measures are proposed to help manage stormwater and mitigate any potential hydrogeological impacts of the development. The identified studies and reports were submitted in support of the development proposal. In addition to these studies and reports, various technical and design drawings were submitted in support of the development proposal to address architectural, landscaping, tree preservation, civil engineering, environmental, traffic management, and transportation infrastructure details. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment and development proposal were reviewed against the applicable provincial, regional, and town land use planning policy. The specific policies are outlined and addressed in detail in the report. As per the report, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and development proposal is consistent with the policies of the PPS and conforms with the policies of the Grove Plan, Regional Official Plan, and Town of Ajax Official Plan. The main concerns of the proposed development are related to environmental, transportation, visual, noise, and economic impacts. I will provide more detail on the environmental impacts in the following slide. Traffic congestion and the need for public infrastructure improvements to accommodate the proposed development were, were raised as concerns. I will provide more detail on the transportation impacts in a couple of slides. To address visual impacts, the proposed development will include a building and site design compatible with the general environment and urban design policies of the official plan in order to achieve a prestige appearance. Outdoor lighting is required to be directed away from adjacent properties and lands designated environmental protection. The proposed lighting for the development proposal will be required to demonstrate zero light trespass on surrounding lands prior to approval. Given the subject lands are within an employment area and not in close proximity to any sensitive residential land uses, a noise study was not required to be submitted for the development proposal. The closest residential is located over 300 meters west from the subject lands. In addition, the environmentally sensitive lands to be protected will, be, will provide a natural buffer between the building and existing residential uses. The subject lands are designated as prestige employment, which prevents warehousing and distribution centers. While I think every municipality within Durham region would like to attract and see the fruition of office development, staff do not have any control over current market trends and demand. The reality is, especially with today's circumstances and lifestyle, there's a large demand for warehousing and distribution center type development, and Ajax has readily serviceable employment lands. Although the subject lands may have previously functioned or currently functioned for agricultural purposes, it is important to remember that these lands are located within the town's urban area within an employment area designated for development. The zoning bylaw amendment looks to rezone the subject lands in accordance with overarching official plan designations and enable the development of employment uses. An environmental impact study, EIS, was submitted in support of the development proposal. 
the EIS evaluates and delineates the existing natural heritage and hydrologic features and associated buffers, referred to as, as vegetation protection zones, VPZs, in order to confirm the appropriate limits of development for the subject lands and inform the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. The EIS also concludes that there are no features of provincial significance on the subject lands and that the removal of existing trees on the lands is not anticipated to create adverse changes on the local landscape, as these features are not known to provide specialized habitat, habitat opportunities. The limits of development ensure that the significant environmental features and functions of the subject lands will be retained and protected and not adversely impacted by the development of the lands. The limits of the wetland located in the northeast corner of the subject lands were staked and a 30 meter VPZ was applied. The drip line of the associated woodland was staked and a 10 meter VPZ was applied. And an updated flood, updated floodplain information from Crothers Creek was provided by the TRCA and a 10 meter VPZ was applied in the western portion of the lands. The Ali Road extension will require the relocation of the existing tributary and encroachment into both the existing wetland and woodland features. As such, a compensation and enhancement plan will, require, will be required to be implemented. Compensation in the form of restoration works and new planting is proposed within the valley corridor associated with Crothers Creek to account for the different encroachments. The details of such will be finalized in consultation with COCA and TRCA as the site plan review process continues. The proposed relocation of the existing tributary will also help restore the existing wetland as water will be conveyed through the wetland to allow for periodic flooding, providing positive benefits to the feature and ecosystem. The proposed restoration and compensation will provide positive ecological benefits. In addition, the proposed zoning bylaw amendment would rezone a significant portion of the subject lands containing the features and VP sets outlined above as environmental protection. The lands proposed to be rezoned as environmental protection will be required to be conveyed to public ownership to secure for the long-term protection and pre preservation of such. A transportation impact study, TIS, was submitted in support of the development proposal. The TIS identifies the estimated traffic generated from the development proposal and the impacts of such on the surrounding road network. The impacts are based on existing road network and projected future background traffic conditions derived for, plan for future planning horizon years. The TIS identifies that under existing and future traffic conditions, there are capacity and delay concerns at several study area intersections. The Salem Road and Kingston Road intersection, as well as the Salem Road and eastbound Highway 401 ramp terminals are key study area intersections currently experiencing at capacity conditions or approaching at capacity conditions for certain movements during the peak hours. With the addition of planned development within the study area, increased congestion in the area is expected and at capacity conditions are inevitable. Unfortunately, Durham Region does not have any significant future intersection and road improvements plan to help address existing and future traffic conditions. The development proposal is expected to generate a total of 273 two-way vehicular trips during the AM peak hours and 281 two-way vehicle trips during the PM peak hours. In order to analyze the future total traffic conditions, the TIS combines the estimated development traffic, the numbers I just uh, outlined, and the projected future background traffic. Such analysis shows negligible difference from the future background analysis. Therefore, the TIS concludes that the estimated traffic generated from the development proposal is anticipated to have a neg negligible impact on the surrounding road network when considering the future traffic conditions. The TIS recommends that signal coordination be reevaluated at the different study area intersections to help improve levels of service and mitigate delays. A sensitivity analysis for the development proposal was undertaken and considered the inclusion of the future Chambers Drive extension, as well as the bus rapid transit BRT extension along Kingston Road. The results of the sensitivity analysis show negligible capacity and queuing differences with or without these additional extensions. Therefore, the extension of such is not anticipated to result with an impactful difference in traffic operations in the study area. Chambers Drive is intended to be extended and provide a connection to the future Audley Road extension, which will cross over the Highway 401 and connect to Bailey Street. The development of the subject lands does not warrant the need for the Chambers Drive extension, and the full completion of the Audley Road extension is not a vital infrastructure project in the town's short-term forecast. The development proposal results with the need for the Audley Road extension, 
and an interim design of the Audley Road extension is proposed, which includes an adjusted right of way width to account for the adjacent land constraints. Audley Road would only be extended south of Kingston Road to the extent necessary to service the development proposal. The applicant will be responsible for the construction of this interim design. While it is evident that larger infrastructure projects are necessary, for example, Highway 401 and Highway 412 improvements, unfortunately, these projects are not just something that can be guaranteed and implemented immediately. In many cases, it does take additional development to help fund and trigger the need for such projects. Staff are of the opinion that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment promotes economic growth and development, provides for the long-term protection and preservation of natural heritage and hydrological features, and enables the development of underutilized lands, further encouraging efficient development patterns. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment would rezone the subject lands in accordance with the overarching official plan designations and enable, and enable economic growth within an area intended for such. The continued review and ultimate approval of the site plan application will include the finalization of all required drawings and reports, entering to all necessary agreements, and satisfying all conditions of the development to the satisfaction of the town and other applicable agencies. As such, staff are supportive of the proposed development and recommend that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment be approved and endorsed by council. This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, appreciate that. I have a motion to uh, receive that recommendation. Uh, moved by uh, Councillor Lee, seconded by Councillor Kahn. I have a speaker's list. Councillor Tyler Morin is first. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you through you to Mr. Simpson. Thank you for your presentation. As we always say, uh, yours was very thorough. So I just wanna get a few things straight here. So. As we speak, the lands that are to be developed are designated general employment, correct? Through the chair to Councillor Tyler Moran. Um, correct, they're zoned a few things. Deferral number one, which relates to a previous um, development proposal, which was appealed. Um, so it, the zone doesn't really mean much, doesn't allow development. General employment um, with a holding provision and as well as agricultural zone. Sorry, that last part? agricultural zone as well. The lands to the west are designated as agricultural zone. Okay, I just wanna get straight because sometimes rezoning is, is a trigger word you know, in, in, in the community, but it's already designated an employment build business that would have been there, but this is just adjusting that to take it from basically general employment to prestige employment in layman's terms-ish, correct? Correct. Yeah, it's basically just rezoning the land so that it matches the official plan designations. Okay. And a lot of it, I think we, we, you know, as we all drive by, as people who live in the neighborhoods and in the surrounding areas, we see it as an underused portion of land in our town. And can you speak a little bit about how you said near the end of your presentation, environmental enhancement plan? Because that excites me, because if there is not just the lands to be developed for business, but if the surrounding lands actually Maybe they look better or they get cleaned up or we use them as part of the Trans Canada Trail. Um, can you speak to what would happen to the subject lands in the town's conservation authority areas? Which yeah, is so, in the top right hand corner. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, um, so uh, in the northeast corner, there is a wetland there with an associated woodland. So that, that has to be preserved, which is why it's not in the development limits and will be rezoned as environmental protection. Um, that is going to be restored, though, however, um, it's not in great condition, currently speaking. And when the tributary, um, which is a headwater drainage feature, which is currently located in the Audley Road right of way, gets relocated, it's going to go through the, the wetland and it's going to convey more water and allow for more periodic flooding, which is going to allow for, you know, different species to go there, um, convey more water downstream. It's going to provide better functions to the environment, essentially. Um, on the west side, all those lands aren't going to be touched. They're not part of the development limit. So they're all going to be conveyed into public ownership, whether it be the town or TRCA. Um, and as a result of the encroachments into the features that have to happen to accommodate this road extension, um, there's going to be various different restoration planting, um, different naturalization methods to the valley lands in the west side. So what that looks like exactly right now, staff are not sure because the compensation plan has to be prepared. 
Um, but that is something that will have to happen. So um, yes, it allows for development, but at the same time, it allows for you know environmental protection and preservation to coexist as well. Excellent, good to hear that. If I could just one more quick question, Madam Chair. Um, the TRCA, which is the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, you were saying how they are going to sign off on this before this all comes to fruition, so to speak? Yes, that's correct. In order to get site plan approval, we would have to have the co um, compensation restoration plans approved. So okay. no, that's no, both no. conservation authorities. I'll leave, I'll leave. I have other questions, but I'll, uh, I'll leave that for my council colleagues. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for those questions. Mayor Collier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, Mr. Simpson, thank you for the presentation. Um, Eric, can you tell me that narrow strip at the bottom that's going to be conveyed to the town on the southern portion of the lands, what is that for? Through the chair to uh, Mayor Collier, that, that is going to be for the Chambers Drive extension, so the future ultimate right of way for it. It's about 26 meters. Okay, I, I, that's what I thought, and I'm just wondering, you know, we, we had planned this will have to cross a, a wetland or a, a, an, an environmental area. Generally, those are pretty expensive. I mean, we, we've had Williamson Road crossing over um, past Harwood to connect that we've kind of abandoned. And I can think of Clements in the south crossing the Duffins and connecting and Pickering that we've abandoned. Is that, I mean, I'm wondering when was that put in our transportation plan? And is that really a a feasible thing to to even be looking at. Correct. So it right now Chambers ends just around Beck Crescent. So it would have to continue from there, which involves a bridge over Crothers Creek, and then continue into the subject lands that you're seeing now and then connect to Audley. So um, it, it's been included in our DC background study as well as our OP for numerous years. I think it is envisioned for the 2023 to 2027 timeframe. Um, however, although it's identified, it's completely development driven. So um, if there's not a need from it, for it, from development, it, it's not something that the town's identified as a vital infrastructure project and you know, due to the funding costs for it, it's not gonna be something that probably happens immediately. Well, given, given that a majority of these lands are gonna be conveyed for the TRCA and therefore protected forever and the immediate east of this property is greenbelt um i don't think that road's ever going to go anywhere and it, yeah it really just would serve as a, an additional passageway to kingston and to avoid the kingston and salem intersection to take you to the 401 essentially okay i i won't dwell on that but i think we can look at probably removing that going forward that's probably not not something that we're going to spend $10 million on going forward with some of our other priorities like Hunt Street. Uh, I just want to talk about the the Audley Road extension that this will trigger. So that's across the 401. Uh, what's the time frame on that? Like when would they expect that to be built? That is, has been identified in the same time frame. However, that, that's been included in the DC studies and in the OP for numerous years as well. And it, it always seems to kind of just get pushed forward every time it gets renewed. Um, that, that is a much more complicated project because the flyover is a very expensive infrastructure piece. Um, so, I mean, staff feel that probably the connection to Audley um, chambers to Audley then to Kingston would be the first part of it. However, the full Audley extension to go over the 401 and connect south, that, I mean, it once again, it's completely development driven. So there isn't really a true timeline for it right now. Well, okay, maybe I misunderstood. I thought you said that this development triggers the need for that overpass. No, it triggers the need for an interim Audley Road extension just south of Kingston Road to provide access for this development site. Okay. Not okay. the full Audley Road extension. If the Audley Road extension, I mean, I'm trying to think of what other development would happen in the area. I can't think of any um, that would push this need further. I think a lot of it would come down to if the lands in the Greenbelt were to be removed, that would ultimately have a big impact. But if not, I mean, right now it would really just be providing, you know, more of fixing a gap in, I guess, the towns infrastructure in surrounding road network. But 
yeah, right now it would be primarily servicing this development proposal. Okay, well, thank you for that clarification. I, I, I guess my next questions are a bit redundant. I was going to ask about, is there an opportunity to have direct 401 access from the site? If that no. extension was, was required, because I mean, traffic is always one of the biggest issues and any way that we can take traffic off of, um, I'm not even going to think about Chambers, Highway 2 would be, uh, would be good. Yeah, and I mean, the town's ultimate goal is to get a Lake Ridge eastbound ramp onto the 401. Right. I mean, because that's really what the true concern is right now. Everything just goes to Salem in the 401. So and that's one of the bigger infrastructure projects that, you know, it's kind of out of our hands. So we, we have lobbied for that. But until the province kind of puts forward that, you know, these additional infrastructure projects aren't going to be that impactful. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the traffic study a little bit. Well, first of all, is this an actual site plan we're looking at or a concept? No, there has been a formal site plan application submitted. Okay. So this is a real plan. What we see is really what we're going to get on this site. This isn't like the one that we dealt with on December 7th, which was a concept. Correct. Okay. So looking at the traffic study, and I think it said there was going to be 234 trips or something generated from this site. Um, when the traffic study is done, did they look at, or did this traffic study consider other properties in the area and other potential uses of other vacant employment lands in the area? So yes, it, it does include anything that we have anticipated for in terms of future development. Um, so that would be active applications or even just something that we've had pre-consultation on. Um, the TIS also, in accordance with the region's guidelines, has to apply um, different growth um, measures to just kind of accommodate for potential growth that's going to happen along the corridor. Um, however, it doesn't look, for example, it doesn't include a potential development of, for say, you know, the lands east of the casino, because the town isn't processing a specific development application for those lands. So to include something like that, would essentially just be coming with a with a hypothetical situation. So it looks at what's before us today, what plan development that we know of, and then it analyzes all of that. Okay. Um, the reason why I ask is there's a letter in there from Boosfields, I think, um, expressing concern from an adjacent landowner about the traffic. And I, I'm just interested if I, you know, there may be maybe something potentially coming on those lands and if that has been considered. So you're saying no, that was not considered in this traffic study. No, and that's simply because we don't have a concrete proposal for those lands. We're not processing anything. We haven't consulted on anything. So to include something specific isn't really an option right now. Um, and given the fact that, in accordance with that letter, I, um, given the fact that Chambers Drive, for example, isn't identified as a vital um, infrastructure project that the town is requiring. We're not going to be thinking of having to add all these additional lands and you know potential uses for them. When there is an actual concrete proposal on those lands, then we would include it. You know, at such time that a development proposal comes forward on those lands, a TIS is going to be required and it's going to evaluate that and it's going to look at you know the potential development that would already occur on these lands. Um, and at such time, if that triggers the need of a Chambers Drive extension, well, then, you know, we'd be in a position to require that. Okay. I, I did go back and I did look at some past transportation studies, and I'm looking at one specifically from Stantec on, uh, looks like around 2015, when Ajax Downs was looking to change their zoning and expand. And looking at that traffic study, I see that they were required to look at all the adjacent landowner land lands and consider the traffic impact of development of all the adjacent properties through their rezoning and an official plan amendment. So I'm wondering why, like they looked at the Sundial trip generation, Passvale, Runnymede vehicle trip generation, Passvale, 
uh, Ajax Downs, Pass Vale Running Mead Distribution, Barcat Lands, Vehicle Trip Generation. I'm wondering why the landowner immediately to the north was required to look at potential uses of all the other surrounding properties regardless because there wasn't any applications on those other properties in 2015 2016 why that same condition wouldn't be applied today because i think that would probably satisfy the concern the adjacent that the adjacent landowner has correct in a large part of that reasoning was because all those the casino itself and the, all the approximate lands, so this includes the, the Ivanhoe Cambridge lands that are before us today, we're all envisioned to be part of this entertainment recreation node. So with a full build out of a casino expansion, it needed to consider all those additional lands because it was always envisioned that they would be part of that entertainment node. So that's why it did look at that. And the past fill lands that it did look at is in fact the Ivanhoe Cambridge lands today. Um, in that study, it identified that with a full casino expansion, as well as 50% development of the Passville lands, so the Ivanhoe lands today, um, that would trigger the need for the Chambers extension. However, what we have today is not a full buildup of the casino. We have a decreasing capacity casino. Um, we don't have the entertainment node, you know, occurring elsewhere. We now have, you know, a warehouse distribution proposal on the Passville lands, which doesn't equate to the same numbers that were previously, you know, projected for that development. Um, so although a full build out of the casino and 50% of the Passville lands would have triggered the need for a chamber's extension, then that doesn't necessarily mean that um, in the existing casino, whatever the, the adjacent East lands are developed as, and this current warehouse are going to tr trigger that same extension need. So when we have a specific proposal before us for those adjacent lands to the casino, then we'll consider it at such time. So if those lands surrounding the Ivanhoe Cambridge lands do produce applications and they do trigger the oddly overpass and the Chambers Road connection, who pays for that? So one thing, although the Chambers extension isn't required through this development proposal. The developer of these lands is financially responsible for providing a contribution to the Chambers extension. So through the development approval process, the town would be collecting a proportionate share that is identified in our development charge background study. Um, so, I mean, the developer of the lands east of the casino wouldn't be financially responsible for it. Okay. Do you see, um, if this is approved today, the traffic um, produced from this development limiting the development of all the surrounding properties? Like, no. Do you, I don't, what I don't want, and again, what I'm trying to avoid is, is an LPAT appeal from an adjacent landowner because they feel that this development will potentially limit their development. And we have a letter in our package today from March 29th, and then they've doubled down with another letter dated yesterday saying they have had some conversations and their position hasn't changed. And they, I think the wording is we reserve our right to appeal. So what, I, what I'm trying to avoid is us approving this today based on a positive staff recommendation only to have it appealed and held up for a year or so. I would rather see if we can't come to a, an agreement or a way to resolve the concerns of the adjacent landowners. I'm not worried about the other, some of the letters that were talked about the environmental pieces, because I think that we have dealt with those and I trust the TRCA to protect those. So I'm not concerned about those concerns, but I am concerned about an LPAT appeal from an adjacent landowner that sent two letters. I think that that carries some weight. And if we can at all avoid that, I would prefer to, to sort of that a little bit. Yeah, understood. I mean, unfortunately we don't have control over who appeals, um, but I, I think, and we'll let, we'll let that member of the public speak for themselves. Um, I think the concern is around whether, you know, if they had someone lined up for the development, if they were then 
you know, if their development triggered the need for your chambers, if that's going to, you know, put a kink in their process and slow it down. But the reality is, is right now, Chambers Drive extension is not identified as a vital need for the town. The development that is before us today has considered the inclusion of it, and it doesn't trigger the need for it. Therefore, the town's not in a position to require such or, you know, move forward with the um, extension ourselves. Um, I'm while we're not thinking about the chambers, I think that's a non-starter. I'm worried about Highway 2 and connections, and I, I would hope that everything is going to go east. Yeah, and, and I, as I had mentioned before, there's already concerns with along Kingston and Salem, and unfortunately, the region doesn't have any immediate plans to fix this. So for the time being, it, it's kind of a situation where the conditions aren't great. They're not going to get better um, but until larger infrastructure projects happen which you know are more of a provincial matter um, there's not much that can be done can you just expand quickly on so did you say the region has concerns about constraints on highway 2 because i reached out to the region today to the commissioner of works and that's not the email that i got back i've got we have received and commented on a traffic study for the ivanhoe cambridge development um, I believe there's still some back and forth, I'm not received anything for the other potential impacts will be difficult to predict, but it doesn't say anything about them, them having concerns about highway two. Can you expand on your comment you just made? Yep. Yeah, it, it's not that it's concerns. It's more so the fact that when we look at existing conditions, it is at capacity or it's approaching capacity at certain periods of the time of the day. So it the region is taking more of a flexible approach now when they consider the intersection because they realize that there's really not much more that can be done. So these at capacity conditions are going to remain as they are until there's bigger infrastructure projects that occur. Okay, and I'm not, I know the region is looking at, at some transit initiatives and dedicated transit corridors through that area, but I'm not aware of the region having uh, plans in their long range capital forecast to expand Highway 2. Are you aware of any? No, right now it's already at its ultimate, so I'm not aware of anything further. Okay, I think I understand the, the other concerns a little bit better now. Uh, those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Simpson, and thank you, uh, Chair Crawford. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, re, uh, Councillor Bauer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Eric, for the report. Uh, very interesting, informative. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for asking all the questions that I had about the road extension. And basically, if I understand what you've said, uh, Mr. Simpson, is the trigger for these extensions is development driven. And this particular application does not meet that requirement except for the short extension of Audley Road South, correct? Through the chair to Councillor Bauer, yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. So I did have some questions. You said something during your report about the cool roof or some environmental or energy efficient measures that the developer is considering. Can, can you go over that again, please? Yeah, so um, there's various sustainable design policies we have in our official plan. Um, so one of them is requiring light colored roofing materials, which refer, are referred to as a cool roof. So that just means kind of like a white colored roof. Um, and that helps with the urban heat island effects um, because darker colors, they absorb more heat, they give off more heat. And when the heat goes into the atmosphere that, you know, that has more issue on air pollution and everything. So when you have these light colored roofs, it helps with that effect. Has the, has the developer, um, I guess, thought of any, any other extraordinary measure, measures other than a cool roof? Like I'm thinking there were some suggestions in the correspondence about um, using solar panels or a green roof where there's actual plantings on, on the one story top. Is that anything that's been considered by the applicant or would be considered by the applicant? Um, there's no specific, um, I guess, plans for solar panels or a green roof. I mean, a green roof in all reality probably isn't the most appropriate for you know an industrial warehouse typically green roofs are something you get in you know more of a sensitive like mixed use development you know something more aesthetically pleasing um, but there are various other things that they're looking to do um, there's going to be an extensive amount of new tree canopy planted so that will help um, 
There's different, um, I guess, sustainable transportation methods that will be implemented. Um, there's going to be carpooling parking spaces provided, um, ample amount of bicycle parking, so to help, you know, lower vehicles and CO2 emissions. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's essentially the, the gist of it. Okay. All right. Um, okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm glad to see the, um, you know, the zoning of environmental protection. I think that's very important. So thank you. Those are my questions. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Khan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Eric, thank you for that presentation. Um, most of my questions were asked and discussed between you and the mayor already, but if you can check on slide 14, <clears throat> just uh, to narrow down my questions, it says that the second bullet says the study concludes that the estimated traffic generated from the development is anticipated to have a negligible impact on the surrounding road network when future growth in the study area is concerned, is considered. Um, what is neg neg negligible impact on the surrounding road network? Can you speak a little on that? To the chair, to Councillor Khan, yes. Um, so I mean, I don't have the specific numbers before me right now, but basically when you factor in all the growth that's happening along Kingston, um, and then like I had mentioned before, the current existing conditions, and that, that's the fact that it's either at capacity or approaching capacity at certain different movements and intersections. Um, when you add this additional traffic that will be generated from this development proposal, yes, it will add to that, um, it's not going to make it any better, but in the grand scheme of things, it, it's not going to be the tipping point or it's going to be, you know, the amount of traffic that, you know, brings it to the worst condition possible. Um, so that's what it's meant by when it says negligible. Um, a TIS looks at specifically what this development proposal will do to negatively impact that surrounding network. And the reality is, is the surrounding network isn't great. Um, so there's not much that can be done to it. So when you factor in everything, um, it will contribute to some more traffic, but it, it's going to have a negligible impact at the end of the day. Okay, sir. Well, thank you for that answer. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Eric. Regional Councilor Dyes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, now, you did mention that there's going to be extensive tree planting. Is that around the building as well as in the parking lot? To the chair, the regional councillor does. Yes, that's correct. There is landscape buffers that are required along Kingston, along Audley, um, as well as along the future Chamber Drives uh, extension. So there'll be tree planting within there. Um, and then within that actual parking lot, there's different landscape islands that will have tree planting. Um, there's different, like, um, landscaping in front of the building as well. Um, there's different tree planting that will occur around the private stormwater management pond that will be on site. Okay, I'm, I'm pleased to see that you actually have tree plantings within the parking lot, which also helps with the heat island, um, which made me think about um, storage for snow removal, because whenever I go see a parking lot with trees, the snow is always piled up on the trees, which damages them. So I wonder if on site there will be storage for snow so that doesn't happen. Yes, yeah, so one of the, the more technical matters that we look through through the site plan review process is snow storage and you know making sure that there's sufficient space for that. Um, so there are various areas kind of scattered throughout the site since it's such a large site and more asphalt predominant areas where it would be stored. Great, thank you. Um, and also, you um, just spoke about the stormwater management pond. What else will there be to mitigate any kind of flooding in the area? Um, so there's very, in addition to the, um, the stormwater management pond, um, there's going to be various different low impact development features. So this can be um, underground storage tanks, um, vegetation swales um, and trenches, um, all stuff to help with um, more groundwater seepage um, because of all the addition of the asphalt that would be occurring. Um, so we're trying to retain as much um, stormwater on site and you know contributing to the groundwater. Oh good, thank you. Also, how many employees will um, be working in that facility? Do they know roughly? Unfor unfortunately, we don't have specific numbers on that right now because they haven't secured a tenant. 
Okay. So yeah, all, all the numbers is kind of based on, I guess, generalizations or kind of, you know, ultimate worst case scenarios from a traffic perspective. Because I would be curious to know, and something we don't do through traffic study studies is uh, look at what types of vehicles are coming in and out. So we know it's a warehouse, so you know you're getting transport trucks, but how many transport trucks, how many vehicles, you know, from employees, car, whatever. And it, I'd be interested to know that, um, particularly when we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions and, and um, the trips in and out peak times in the morning and afternoon. It'd be interesting to know what types of vehicles are coming in and out. Is there any way of doing that? Unfortunately, without knowing the specific tenant, it isn't really possible to do that. But given that it is a warehouse of a substantial size, I think the majority would be transport trucks. So once they have a tenant though, would that be something that we'd be able to look at? Because we'd understand more of the operations of the facility? Um, I mean, through the site plan review process, if, if they did um, like secure a tenant before obtaining site plan approval, um, I mean, we could ask for further details on that, but there could be a situation where, you know, if all the approvals in the, were in place, we still might not know the tenant. So right. if that's the case, we wouldn't be able to, you know, require something like that. All right, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if there's no other questions, I just have one question, if that's possible. Uh, Mr. Simpson, uh, with all the traffic coming coming and going off of Highway 2, we know that the BRT is planning to do a huge um, uh, bus rapid transit all down the Highway 2, which will have a medium right down the center of the road. So um, I'm just curious as to um, Will the region then be doing their major interest, uh, infrastructure upgrades at that point? Because uh, I would think a U-turn with a transport truck at Audley would be a little difficult if they want to go westbound. Uh, has that been, I know it's you know not in the probably five-year plan. However, EA studies are happening this year and design plans are being submitted next year. So I'm just curious as to um, if that part was considered in the, in the transportation considerations. Yeah, so the sensitivity analysis that the transportation study did, it looked at the inclusion of Chambers Drive as well as the BRT. Um, and when it had the BRT included, um, although there would have been some benefits, it wasn't anything super impactful. So um, that just kind of went towards the conclusion that, you know, it's not this development that re requires the need for the BRT or anything like that. Um, but as, can you just repeat the other part of your question? I just want to no, make no, sure. Just, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious because I'm sure a medium down the center of the road is going to be impactful. I'm sorry, but it's impactful for everyone. Uh, I can't imagine that it won't be impactful. So I'm assuming uh, that in order to keep the traffic moving safely out of that building, the region would have to do some major yeah, infrastructure upgrades at that point. It would be impossible just to plop a medium down the center of the road and not expect that it's going to impact traffic. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I misunderstood your, your question there. Yeah, so I mean, the region's gonna have to consider that when they do get to that level. I mean, it's very possible that, you know, at that point, maybe, you know, the introduction of the BRT and the limiting lanes that are gonna come of that for the construction triggers the need for the chamber's extension itself. Like we don't know that yet. Um, so that is something that the region is gonna have to carefully consider. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone from the public here that wishes to speak? Madam Chair, we have two registered delegates on this item for tonight. Okay, uh, let's have them. <laughs> All right, the first registered delegate on this item is Mr. Keith Saar. Hello, Mr. Saar. You have five minutes. Good evening. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak. Um, I have two uh, primary concerns that uh, have
Is Mr. Sam and, frozen? Uh, one important. Are you hearing me? We can hear you I now. I think you froze there just for a minute. Could you just repeat what you said? Yeah. Well, my main my main interest is um, is traffic, followed up by the um, the noise pollution caused by that traffic, um, and uh, it begins with. I'm trying to turn my cell phone off so I can mitigate the uh, interruptions. Uh, the, the primary factor would seem to be the exit from the 401 that most of these trucks would use. And uh, it probably, although I'll, I'll bow to better experts, but would it be fair to assume that most of the trucks will be traveling west along the 401 and will want to avoid the bottleneck that is the three lane uh, tight uh, section over Carruthers Creek? So their preferred exit is going to be Salem. Now, I was dismayed uh, by uh, the mayor's remarks that the bridge over uh, Carruthers on Chambers and the Chambers extension, to quote the mayor, he mentioned it's likely a non-starter. Well, that's too bad because the um, opportunity for these trucks that are likely to exit at Salem and uh, need to get into this uh, facility uh, would have been very convenient to make a right into Chambers and avoid the busy area of Salem and, and Kingston. Uh, and as your develop the, the proponent uh, seems to be very much uh, and The chambers extension will in fact be built in the uh, access points on that on that street so um i urge the council to think about actually making the carruthers extension a dependency for this particularly large uh, development and in that way uh, uh, mitigating the risk that regular traffic to avoid the backed up trucks and they Based on your traffic study, we're talking about, what was it, 217? Uh, I saw somewhere or more at peak periods. That's about five, four or five trucks a minute um, are going to need to, to uh, get around the Salem and Kingston uh, turn, right turn. Uh, and uh, regular traffic backed up behind that will likely uh, do what several people now do, and that is cut through the Carruthers uh, neighborhood along uh, Chambers, Allard, Wicks uh, Drive uh, route. So we are uh, in, the, uh, in my neighborhood, adjacent to this, just the other side west of Carruthers Creek, are very concerned that this will uh, induce a lot more regular traffic to cut through our area, uh, particularly if the trucks are forced to continue up sailing, backing up that right turn, uh, because uh, it's the best way for them to enter this site. And I recall the plan calls for a right in, right out exit at the northwest corner of this development, which also has a circular road within it. So all of the trucks are gonna prefer, I don't know about all, but certainly the vast majority the 401 exit at Salem, north on Salem to Kingston. Kingston to the right in, right out. So back to my point, Carruther, um, Chambers extension is huge. And I urge the town not to discount that because it will alleviate this problem and several others not to mention the 20,000 new residents we have, or relatively new, living north on Audley, who now are going to have to contend with trucks coming to and fro from uh, the Amazon uh, warehouse distribution center. Uh, and uh, the connection down through Audley, connecting with Chambers, would be a, 
excellent alternative route for them to the to the 401 again avoiding that bottleneck on the 401 that is uh, true in both directions extensively through the day not just at rush hours so um you know, just uh, urge the council to consider making a, a dependency for this approval being agreement to fund and build the bridge and the chambers extension eastward and require the Audley extension south to meet chambers. Uh, the idea of going over the 401, I realize, is, is prohibitive in the foreseeable future, but at least plan for that. The other issue, environmental issue, um, we know that the, there are uh, agencies that will appropriately manage, as the mayor and others have said, the environmental considerations. But I do remind the council that uh, some developers, I'm not saying this one necessarily will do the same, but some developers have ignored all that and cut down trees, you'll recall, huge issue. It's development where the developer there just bought a hundred year old uh, trees in the woodlot uh, to the east of them because they wanted to get good sight lines from the 401. So I urge uh, serious and um, a close monitoring uh, of this uh, construction to ensure that there isn't excess encroachment into the wonderful Carruthers Creek protected area. Finally, noise pollution. Um, we live uh, about a mile away from the 401 and it's a constant hum. We can hear it as I'm sure many of you uh, can hear it south and north of the, of the 401. So noise travels. Uh, I would expect this type of industry, even though we don't know the actual tenants, will operate 24 seven, that's probably a reasonable expectation. So we're gonna have trucks coming and going, not just at peak periods, but all through the night. We're gonna have them coming and going Saturdays and Sundays. This is something that will generate noise in the quiet moments when one's hopefully uh, relaxing on one's deck or wherever. We live on a hill to the west of this and I know noise pollution has been discounted as a non-issue because there's 300 meters between it and the closest street, which would be Galea west of it. Uh, and there are trees in the green belt in between. However- I don't, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, sir, but you'll have to wrap up very quickly. Uh, I'm about to wrap up. This is my Thank last you. point. So um, to discount noise pollution, I believe is to uh, minimize uh, what will occur here and the amount of uh, you know, beeping trucks backing up and, and tailgates slamming shut. Um, and uh, because most of us in Cataraqui live on the hill above the tree line, noise will, will travel. And so I urge that the some uh, buffering uh, berms or uh, advanced measures to ensure there's no spill of this noise, particularly as the, the loading bays are facing uh, us westward um, and many of them. So uh, that's another consideration that I'd urge the council to require uh, and to embed within the site, site plan. Thank you very much. Um, I believe Mayor Collier, you had a question. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Mr. Saar, and thank you for your comments. Um, I, I'm not being rude, but are you a planner or a traffic engineer, Mr. Saar? I'm a, I'm an intelligent resident. Okay, I'm just I don't want to get in an argument with a planner about planning issues. You made some some rather uh, some statements that uh, as fact. So I just wanted I just wondered where they came from. What statements did I make as fact? Well, I'm going to ask a few questions. Okay. Uh, you opened with talking about uh, the sound and the traffic. But from your statements, I'm led to believe that you want the Chambers Drive connection to happen and which would result in not only all the truck traffic from this, 
but you also went further and said, this would be a good opportunity for all the truck traffic from the Amazon development to come down oddly and go across there too. Did I understand that correctly? No, you didn't. Okay. Uh, partially, you were correct. The idea of, of connecting uh, chambers, which goes around our community, not directly through it. Um, it we already have warehousing, hotels, gym, uh, lots of traffic on oh. chambers now. So to continue over the creek, and I worry about the environmental challenges, but I, I know there are uh, methods that can be used. Well, that, that's fine. My question is, is that your preference? Because it sounded to me from your statements that you I'm wanted afraid. the truck but traffic. I've never, I've, never, I've never said the Amazon trucks will come down Audley. That's not what I inferred. What I did say was that residents living north on Audley, about 20,000 of them in that development, are going to have to navigate around the Amazon trucks that will likely be using 412, okay. presumably, or Lake Ridge, to get to and from the 401 at a Salem Junction. Okay. So it would be an advantage to, to them, those 20,000 people, to come down Audley through the extension being proposed and then make a right onto the extended chambers and get to the 401 in a very convenient way, avoiding uh, the bottleneck so that they expect to have. To understand your town. statement, your, your intent, in the chamber's extension is more, not so much the truck traffic, but more to get the commuter traffic that cuts through Wicks and Allard in your neighborhood to take an alternate route down oddly and across chambers. It's both. It's very much both because if the truck traffic is crossing through chambers, then they're mitigating the already excessive traffic okay. at Salem and Kingston Road, Mr. Mayor. I'll just, I'll just, let you know, I, I have reviewed the traffic study for the Amazon development and that traffic is destined to cross Roslyn and connect at the 412. And we're pushing the province hard to get a connection there at the 412. So none of that traffic has to actually even touch Salem or come near. So, and, and that, that speaks to the other traffic up there as well, hopefully using Kerrison. So- Well, uh, again, yeah. you, you, you're, you're ignoring the bottleneck on the 401 that's going to induce these trucks, many for Amazon and this distribution center, to exit at Salem, not to go to. I, I think I asked if you've looked at the traffic study. I'm not aware that they're actually going to come Salem. I, I'm going to ask the Those coming from Quebec. After, I'm going to ask the traffic engineer after what the proposed route is, because I suspect it might be east on Highway 2 to Lake Ridge. Um, but I, I'm going to ask the traffic engineer that. Um, the other question I had, Mr. Saar, that you mentioned was about, well, I guess this ties into the, to the traffic route and, and the sound. I mean, 234 vehicles a day over a 24 hour period. And a lot of these distribution centers tend to operate after hours. It's but 234 an hour. Not a day, it's an uh, hour. I Can we get clarification on that, Mr. Simpson? Because I don't believe that's correct. That's what I said and saw in the report. Well, I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask Mr. Simpson. Yeah, th uh, Mayor Collier. Um, the traffic numbers I had previously mentioned are through the AM and PM peak hours. So it's not per day, it was just looking at a specific AM, so like, you know, like seven to nine AM, um, and then for PM, like 4 to 6 PM, there would be 273 two-way vehicle trips during the AM and then 281 two-way trips during the PM. Okay. Hour, yes, the hour. And what I'm saying is that's not all hours of the day. That's during the absolute peak time. Correct. Okay, good. All right. I, I mean, I'll, I'll ask the traffic people more of this just to, just to address your concerns. My last question is on cost, because I do know a little bit about what it will cost to build that extension across to the taxpayers, but do you know what it will cost? Because I'll ask staff to confirm, but the preliminary numbers, when we look at other crossings like Hunt Street, like Audley Road, when we looked at potentially doing a crossover 
so the train whistle wouldn't have to blow and others like that are in the $10 million range, which are not something that we can put money into. Um, but were you aware uh, that it's that significant of a cost? And there's two other projects, Williamson Drive and Clements, that both had to cross environmental features that have virtually been abandoned. They might still be on the plans, but they're not happening because we just don't have the 10 plus million dollars to put in a bridge to allow traffic to travel over a, a wetland or an environmental feature. Well, uh, I would have expected it to be that or more. Um, okay. So the, the dollars uh, don't surprise me. I think it, it only makes sense if you bundle into the rationale, the advantage to residents north on Audley that will have another alternative to um, to uh, get onto the 401 without having to go through that bottleneck that is the three lane section in either direction uh, if they use Lake Ridge or the 412 once that's open. So this is a, a real opportunity to serve your, what are 20 odd thousand residents north of us in a, in a more reasonable way, as well as address the trucks for this distribution center, not the not not expecting the Amazon ones to come down this route, um, but the, the trucks can get to the center and use the interior circular road to arrive at whichever loading bays are appropriate for them without having to navigate Kingston at all. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any other questions for uh, Mr. Sayre? If not, thank you very much for taking the time to come and make a delegation to council tonight. Have a really great evening. Stay safe. Mr. Clerk, do we have another uh, person to make a delegation? Oh, there you are. Yes, Madam Chair, we have Mr. Justin Peacock. Hello, Justin, how are you? Hello, Marilyn, great yourself? Good, good, go ahead, sir. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to my house, by the way. This is a little different than uh, I'm used to. I miss the free coffee. For what it's worth anyways um me too i'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh one of two things happens here that i'm brief and everybody goes home happy uh or uh, my internet cuts out and everybody else goes home happy so i'll uh i'll get on with it um first of all it's nice to be among friends uh i think i've i know everybody here personally so uh, it's been a while since we last uh last got together but i'm hoping everybody's doing okay um, I don't know if I need to do much introduction about us, our family, what we own, uh, like our, our land holdings in the area have been around since the 50s before Ajax was Ajax. Um, and uh, what we have done is we've made a habit of conducting responsible development that's provided some pretty meaningful employment over the years. So as an example, we have our Horseman Center that's opened in 1969. Uh, we developed our, our greenhouses in the, uh, in the 80s. Um, uh, we developed uh, Peacock Downs that became Ajax Downs. Uh, in 2009 and Casino Ajax along with that. And along with all those things, we, we felt like we've, um, uh, we've made it a, a, you know, a personal uh, mission to develop responsibly in the town. And I think we've done a pretty good job of it. At least I hope that's what the developments speak to. Um, we obviously have a pretty vested interest in seeing Ajax's population and employment opportunities grow uh, in that responsible and respectful way. Um, the colorful canvas uh, of the official plan, um, it kind of, it, you know, it paints a pretty clear picture of the town's significant development uh, objectives uh, uh, for the sites that are located between Salem and Lake Ridge Road along Highway 2. There's a huge swath of land there and uh, it provides a huge opportunity for Ajax going into the future. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, we think that it's important that the maximum development potential uh, for housing supply and employment are realized for those lands that are not already developed, given the lack of both of those um, in Ajax, Durham, and the greater GTA. Um, I couldn't agree more with the conclusion of the staff report that I did read, which is that the Ivanhoe site, this application, it would be a good use of 70 acres of employment land uh, that are otherwise underutilized and would expand the economic base of Ajax. I, 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 ha I have to agree with that. Um, just to give you some, some flavor around our properties, if you don't know about them already, 
Um, uh, our lands comprise of approximately 170 acres of net developable land uh, on the north side of Kingston Road adjacent to this site. Um, west of Crothers Creek, we have approximately 30 acres of high density mixed use lands. That's part of the uptown commercial uh, corridor area and 20 acres of employment lands just to its immediate north. Um, east of Crothers Creek, we have approximately 120 acres of prestige employment land that are home in part uh, to the Ajax Downs complex. Uh, our west block is designated for high density uses. And if developed at the same density uh, as the sites to the immediate west of us are proposing, um, it would end up being around 5 million square feet of additional development uh, in that area that's yet to be realized. That's thousands of much needed homes, that's thousands of construction jobs and permanent jobs, tens of millions in, of dollars in uh, development charges and obviously some substantial property taxes going forward. Sorry, Justin, just to let you know you're at the halfway point. Okay, uh, thanks. <laughs> Our East Employment Block is already zoned to permit intensive development of employment uses, more than three and a half million square feet with relevant and reasonable development densities. To put this in perspective, that's at least three times the footage of the new Amazon building. Uh, on our former property just to the south, um, or sort of to the north of us, and will ultimately facilitate thousands of more permanent jobs. And there's obviously a lot of pressure on our family on us right now to, uh, to develop these. There's a lot of people waiting to move into the area. Um, we'd, have, we'd been approached by Ivanhoe years ago about the, the, their future development um, and, uh, for their land, and they'd rightfully taken a collaborative approach to addressing future road network improvements like the Audley Chambers extension. Those talks stalled when they abandoned their original plans for the site and were not revived. We don't want to stand in the way of progress. This is now our only forum to raise the concerns that we'd hope could get addressed before an application is approved by uh, this, this CAP or council. For some background, through the municipal, or sorry, through the multiple transportation assessments conducted for the recent casino zoning, no less than five independent traffic consultants the region and the town reviewed the same road network and concluded, concluded the capacity was significant a significant issue at the two major intersections being Kingston Road and, uh, uh, at Salem and Lake Ridge. We were subsequently required to do substantial study on traffic impact and both on and off site mitigation measures. After reviewing the TMIG TIS for this application, we think Ivanhoe could have submitted a TIS with more fulsome and appropriate consideration of future development uh, conditions that will ultimately share this small stretch of road and these critical intersections. Uh, we also think that the traffic data that they relied on could have taken into account peak times as they relate to surrounding uses like the existing casino and racetrack. Um, they, they took into account only non-peak days. And between 2013 and 2018, as part of the casino rezoning exercise we participated in, we were appro appropriately asked by town staff to assess the development of the past fail lands, amongst others, when evaluating future traffic conditions. I need about one more minute if I'm able to be granted it. Okay. While we appreciate the urgency that Ivanhoe may have to develop the lands and take advantage of current market conditions, we think that the most appropriate course of action in the best interest of the town and its long-term objectives would be for council to defer a decision on this application until Ivanhoe, the town, the region and ourselves have had the opportunity to fulsomely investigate any additional road network improvements that may be required in conjunction with the proposed development. We're asking Ajax to hold Ivanhoe to the same high standard of care for transportation planning that we have been held to in the past for these critically important sites and provide more contextually re relevant analysis that includes reasonable forecasting for nearby development on top of the basic future background traffic. We believe a brief delay in this application to, to facilitate collaborative con consultation isn't worth jeopardizing the development potential of the town's largest and argu arguably most important uh, and development ready employment and residential blocks. Um, we've discussed this with Ivanhoe and, uh, uh, and um, I'd open it up for questions if you have any. Thanks for hearing me out. Thank you very much. Mayor Collier. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Mr. Peacock, for your delegation. Um, can you finish what you're just saying? You, you had a discussion with Ivanhoe and you're open for questions. What was the response to the discussion? So I think there's there's uh, it was very recent and there's a, pi a positive dialogue there. Um, I I'm assuming that their preferred path right now would just be to go ahead and get their approvals. I'm sure they want it, um, but there is a, a um, I think a mutual understanding between us that we'd be willing to work 
uh, expeditiously between us to address any issues that might be outstanding uh, prior to them uh, uh, getting their approvals. Okay. I, the last thing I want to do is stand in the way of, of any development, whether it be this one or future, but I also don't want to see one development have a negative effect on another, which reading your two um, letters from your planners is the concern. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty significant one. Okay. I was also, as I said, I think you probably listened earlier to my questions um, to the commissioner at the region, and I've sent another email right after that asking for some more information. How long do you think, I haven't asked if this is time sensitive or not, and I'll ask the proponent when they come forward, but how much time do you think would be required to have those discussions and uh, see if you can come to some, some form of agreement? And, and the reason why I ask that is, again, there's, there's no guarantee you'll come to an agreement. So delaying mm -hmm. something today doesn't necessarily mean that in a month from now, you're not gonna appeal it anyway. So how long do you think would, would be needed to have those discussions? Yeah, fair enough. So I think it, it's subject largely to the um, to Ivanhoe's uh, uh, engineers and who who they've brought on staff and their availability. I know that they're obviously interested in having this um, uh, fast tracked. Um, uh, we're willing to work with them. I can't see this taking more than that period of time between now and the next cap meeting for us to have a meaningful dialogue and get down to a uh, get down to a resolution. Um, again, it's it's I don't mean to put it on them, but I think it's mostly on them to do some justification work and for us to review uh, quickly thereafter. Okay, I did ask a question about the, um, the Casino Ajax development and why when your family did that, you were required to look at traffic, your traffic study had to look at all the other developments because of the tourism note. Are you satisfied with that answer? I, I'm, I'm not, and with, with respect, with all due respect to Eric, um, uh, the lands that we, uh, that we identified and that we studied were not just the Passville lands to the south. We identified a number of different uh, lands. Um, uh, in fact, the majority of employment lands in, in Northern Ajax um, as part of our original, our original submission and then subsequently through the, uh, through the OMB appeal that was uh, had later on. We did extensive, extensive study ahead of the uh, zoning um, and then uh, through that OMB appeal. And um, only a fraction of that was part of that node Actually, in fact, it was only the pass fail lands that were part of that note, and we studied probably a dozen. Okay. I, I'm going to be asking the, the proponent when they come forward, but if this were passed today, it wouldn't be ratified by this council for two weeks, two weeks less a day, I guess, since it's Tuesday. Um, and then that starts the appeal period, which is another few weeks. So we're looking at five to six weeks. Would that be enough time uh, to have these conversations, do you think, to look at, um, see if you can satisfy your concerns? So I think that amount of time is reasonable, but the one thing I'd be cautious of, and I'm you know, being open and honest about this, is that um, if, if this is approved today without the dialogue, it puts us in an awkward position in the event that if we can't come to terms in the next couple of weeks or one week or whatever it takes for their traffic engineers and the rest to get in touch with ours and what have you, that we're effectively pigeonholed to going to the OMB or DELPAT or whatever it's called now. Uh, I think it would be a lot more productive uh, uh, and fruitful if we had the opportunity to have brief, meaningful dialogue with them um, and come back and revisit this when all parties are happy um, obviously, uh, if, if we can't come to an agreement or, or, or traffic doesn't work out, then, you know, we'll have to deal with it at the time. Um, uh, but it's, I think it's worth giving a shot. That's my own opinion. Okay. Well, I'm sure they're listening because they're on next. So that will be my first question when I have the opportunity is, um, will they make themselves available to have that discussion and will they be willing to expedite it? And I'm, I'm pretty confident I won't speak for them, but given Nobody wants to have a, a year-long LPAT appeal delay a, delay their process. Um, I, I, I think probably you guys can work together, but I'll ask those questions. But thank you very much for answering mine, Mr. Peacock. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Is there any other questions for Mr. Peacock? Uh, Regional Councillor Dyes. Actually, for staff, I'm. I just wanted to know if there had been uh, an application received by the town, or if the town has any information about proposed development on the Peacock lands. Uh, through the through the chair to regional councillor guys, 
Uh, no formal applications have been submitted to the town on lands east of Alexander's Crossing uh, or any of the land holdings currently being held currently by the Peacoffs. Uh, that includes any, we have had some, uh, one pre-con for the property at the northwest corner of uh, the roundabout just north of the, the casino. Um, we've had some high level discussions a number of years ago uh, with um, Justin and his father Barry with regards to the mixed commercial corridor lands to the um, west of the Carruthers Creek, but no formal applications and no formal pre-consult applications have been submitted to the town for our review. And just roughly, it's a general question, but how much time would that take to go through that process? Even, you know, I guess you'd start with the pre-con to go through that whole process. Well, it I starts know. way before a pre-con submitted because they're the, the landowners probably working with consultants, coming up with concept plans, maybe doing some high level analysis, whether it be uh, traffic briefing or the FSR, like a functional servicing type of report to see whether or not uh, water, sanitary and storm, how that's going to be handled. So it could take months and months and months before they even get to the town or approach the town to, to apply for a pre-consult. And then once a pre-consult comes in and we do our thing here at the town, um, you know, resubmission to a real application that flip a coin it all depends who you're dealing with at that time what their financial capability is at that time to uh, move the application forward do they have a tenant for the lands or are they doing it on spec there's a number of factors that kind of play into the you know the eventual submission of a formal development application Okay, well, that's helpful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, is there any other questions for Mr. Pico? Okay, thank you very much for coming in and presenting today. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, okay, so now we're going to hear from the applicant. I'm sorry. Hi, everybody. Oh, there you are. Hi, how are you? <laughs> not bad, not bad. Uh, Michael Testaguza from the Bigliari Group here. Let me just turn on the camera. Put a face to the name. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So I uh, certainly want to address some of the comments I've had uh, come forward so far today. Uh, so firstly, definitely are willing to um, meet with, uh, with the Peacovs and with the region and with the town. In fact, uh, after having seen the letter, I reached out to the town and requested that, you know, that meeting be set up uh, as soon as possible. Uh, but as the mayor said, uh, you know, he, he was right to assume that we do want to move forward at this point. I'd like to point out that these applications have been in since July of last year. July of last year, there was a traffic report to review and to provide these types of comments. There's been no receipt of comments until a week before the recommendation report comes forward. And that comment is that the traffic study needs significant work despite the terms of reference being determined with the region and with the town and including no less than 10 background development applications plus worst case scenario assumptions for the site plus background tra traffic generally not attributed to any specific development. So I'd like to say that, you know, this isn't a, a poorly done report as it was characterized in any way uh, whatsoever. It was done, you know, to the towns and the region specifications <laughs> Uh, and it's been in circulation uh, in two different forms uh, for, for over a year. Um, it's, it's troubling that those comments come a week before a decision is made when notice to the public, certainly of the open house, which occurred in November, uh, uh, you know, would have put any potential landowners in the area onto the fact that an application had been circulated, if not earlier. So we're, we're certainly willing to enter into those discussions have those discussions, uh, try to put um, the concerns of area residents, um, you know, uh, and other landowners 
uh, into perspective and try to ease those concerns uh, however we can. But I'd like to point out that the traffic report, it's, it's not as it's characterized as not being done to standard, first off. Uh, and, and secondly, that these comments are coming at the absolute last second in this approval process. But the other thing I'd like to point out is a conceptualization of what actually council is being asked to approve today. You're not asked to approve the site plan, uh, which is really what the traffic report is linked to. You're asked to uh, approve a rezoning of the lands to prestige industrial. The lands are designated in the official plan for prestige industrial uses, or sorry, <laughs> prestige employment. Um, and so what you're being asked to do is bring your zoning bylaw into conformance with your official plan. Uh, I don't see a reason why that needs to be delayed. Council's provided direction that these lands are prestige employment. We've made an application to have these lands zoned prestige employment. So I think it's, it's not, not even necessarily being pegged to the right application, um, these, these questions of traffic necessarily. Uh, thirdly, and I'll point out, you know, something that was said by, by Mr. Sari, that, you know, Chambers and Audley will benefit people to the north, will benefit people coming from the east. Uh, the, the benefits to Chambers and Audley are extensive because they're arterial roads. These aren't local roads that, you know, are normally built by a developer through a development application of a subdivision, for example. These are arterial roads. They're identified in the town's master transportation plan because they serve a larger area, not simply this development. They provide benefits for a larger area, not simply this development. I think that's something that shouldn't be lost here, is that these are not local roads. These are arterial roads. They benefit a whole uh, subset of people town-wide. Uh, so again, we would definitely have the meeting uh, and, and potentially more than one. Um, happy to provide additional information to the PCOFs uh, and to anyone else who may need it. Uh, happy to set those meetings up with the region. Uh, but again, we do want to move forward at this time. It's been a year and these comments are coming a week before approval. And, uh, you know, frankly, as the mayor said, there's no guarantee that anything we do can satisfy and will satisfy someone else. And so, you know, the delay doesn't seem to be appropriate nor fair, given the amount of time that's elapsed uh, through these applications with no comment from anybody in the public. Uh, or sorry, not, not from anybody in the public. I should take that back because I know Mr. Sorry did attend the uh, public open house. Uh, the Peacocks did not. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from council who has any questions? Uh, Regional Councillor Lee? And then Mayor Collier. Thank you, Chair. Um, so that being said, uh, a delay of one month, because that's ultimately what we're talking about right now. Like how how crippling would that be to the project? Like I, I'm, I understand your uh, concerns, but I also think, um, yes, it's at the 11th hour. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. But at the same time though, it, you know, I, I, I've always been about due diligence and crossing your T's, dotting your I's, making sure that we're, you know, the best plan goes forward. And, I'm, you know, everything staff's laid out, everything you've laid out makes sense. But I'm saying, like, what, what is the worst case of uh, the extra month to have these conversations and to ensure that, you know, we're, Ajax as a municipality, as a council, we are maximizing our employment opportunities. So I'm just wondering if we do delay the month, what, 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 how would that adversely affect? I mean, I understand it would adversely affect, but not just uh, from your point of view. Well, I can answer it. I'm Ivanhoe Cambridge, Jillian Jackson. Uh, we are trying to get in the ground this year to start development in order to get foundations in the ground this year. In order to do so, we have to start our earthworks in June and that already is a stretch. Um, so we are not gonna start any work there unless we know we have a rezoning in place. Um, and so, yeah, delaying it a month will take us to May, um, at which point we won't have the time to put contracts in place to have our contractors start for June. Um, so that will mean that this project essentially will be delayed at least six months from opening, uh, if not more. 
So that's the impact. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jared. Marilyn frozen. Uh, chair, chair, Marilyn. Oh, I think she is frozen. I think she's frozen. I guess that comes to me then. So, um, <laughs> thank you, Regional Council Relief, for your questions. I'll go on to now to Mayor Collier. <laughs> Mayor Collier, go ahead. My questions have have been asked. I'll, I'll just say I, I do trust that um, Mr. Uh, Testaguza. I hope I said that correctly, Miss Jackson. That that you will have those meetings. And, uh, and, and try and expedite. Because again, nobody wants to be hung up at the board. We've seen this just happen on the, the Annandale lands in December where the adjacent landowner appealed it and that stopped and nobody wants that. So I'm hoping over the, uh, the next few weeks, you guys will, will have those meetings. We'll be able to, to, to sort out some of these uh, concerns. Thank I will uh, hand the uh, chair position back to uh, Regional Councillor Crawford. Sorry, apparently everything in my house is unstable. Uh, where, where were we? Uh, Mayor Collier, were you, were you finished? I'm done. I think we're going to bring on the, uh, the recommendation or the motion. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, for your comments, uh, Michael and Jillian. Can I just get clarification on the timelines then? Are you talking two weeks until our, to the council meeting for discussion? So it doesn't delay them further? That is to the mayor. Uh, yeah, Mayor Collier, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm, so there I'm was not... talk of a month. There was talk of a couple of weeks till the oh, next what month. I, what I said was if this was approved today, we wouldn't ratify it to our next council meeting, which is in 13 days. Right. And that starts the clock for the appeal period, which is, I don't know if it's 20 or 30 days. I don't remember. I think it's, I think it's 30 days. So that together, the two weeks and then the 20 or 30 days gives us four to five weeks, which, which I'm hoping is enough time to, uh, for the parties to, to sort this out. And if not, then I guess it's up to the other uh, landowners if they do appeal it. I mean, that, that will go through that process as well. Um, so, uh, sorry, I, I guess I missed, uh, Chair, if I may ask a qu another question, one more question. If that's 100%, go ahead. Um, so uh, through the chair to the applicant, then, um, if the PCOVs, in fact, do issue an OMB or LPAT uh, challenge, would that not delay your project? Uh, I mean, I can answer that. Uh, the, the obvious answer is, is yes, it would. Um, but of course, there's no guarantee that through delaying this over the course of time, that wouldn't be the case in any event. If, if there's not an answer that, you know, can be satisfied between staff, ourselves, and, and the PCOVs, uh, you know, in the reasonable near term, uh, I would suspect then that in any case, that is something that the PCOVs would likely uh, feel appropriate to appeal. I don't know. I don't speak for Justin. And, and you know, I, I am happy to work with Justin. <laughs> I know some, some of the comments earlier were, were adversarial, but very happy to work with you going forward. Um, it's not meant to be adversarial. It's just meant to point out that, you know, we've come very far at this point. Um, and, and I think at this point, it'd be reasonable to move it forward. Uh, we believe the traffic study's done a good job. So if there's significant changes to the traffic study uh, that, that are being asked for, you know, that's, that's going to be an issue on our end, I would think. Okay. Thank uh, Jillian, you. I don't know if you have anything to add may, to that. May I Sorry. just say one thing? Can I speak? Um, this traffic study was conducted with extensive consultation with both the town and the region, like many, many conversations and meetings with both the town and the region so that we, it was ensured that all future development was captured that they required. Um, so I just like to make that point very clear because this was not done you know, on our own, on a whim. This was done with extensive consultation with both the town and the region who have agreed to the terms of reference, who agreed to all the background studies that should have been included, who agreed to all the future developments that should have been included, agreed to the growth rates that was included. So this is not, this was done with extensive consultation with both the town and the region. 
Hi, everybody. This is uh, Chris Day at TMIG. If I could just have a second to speak. Uh, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, so just kind of building off what was mentioned there, we have had extensive consultations and, and a lot of talk has been around background developments considered. And before the study was even commenced, we were given the background developments to include from the town, uh, as well as the general background growth rates that were supposed to be considered. Uh, and we also used traffic counts. One thing that was mentioned as well and some of those comments we received was that uh, traffic counts weren't post or pre-pandemic, but they actually were. Those counts that were used as part of that study were before the pandemic had hit. Uh, and so we had taken that into account as well. So we, we feel we have a, a pretty uh, robust uh, traffic study here that has uh, covered off everything we've been asked to include. Uh, so I'd just like for you to consider that as well as part of your, uh, your decision. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Tyler Morin. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, a quick question, as we all say. Uh, so uh, the, the gentleman, sorry, I, I, I don't, uh, Mr. Day, Chris Day, uh, you said you had extensive consultation. However, um, I'm not saying you had to or you did, but just wondering factually, so you never did speak directly with the Peacocks or they didn't reach out to you, you didn't reach out to them as of yet? Is that correct? Um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, Chris, I, I, I can answer that, that question um, for, for the counselor. Just wondering, yeah. Go, go yeah, ahead. no, no, no. I, I, I mean, I can answer that question. You know, typically when you're doing a, a traffic report, you take the background developments that are given to you by the town. Um, adjacent landowners are, are notified of the application going forward. And if they have any comments, you know, they, they have the, the ability to come forward uh, throughout the process, make their concerns known to staff or more likely and more often than not, you know, pass them along to us uh, for us to have that discussion. So, you know, the background studies are given to us or the background developments are given to Chris. Um, he, he and TMAG, they input them, they run their models as they're requested to do by staff. Uh, and if anyone, you know, throughout the course of the process so over the last year comes forward and says, hey, we have an idea, we would like you to include this, then a discussion can be had about that. Uh, and, and a reasonable solution arrived to, you know, over the course of time. Um, but, you know, to, to, to have perhaps uh, such a thing occur now, um, hey, you know, it's, it's a little bit late in the process for that, typically speaking anyways. Again, not, not, not in any way precluding any meetings we could have, and hopefully we can come to a productive um, a solution among the parties going forward. But, you know, it's, it's typically, that's the, the process. Okay, and I appreciate you saying that. I think you've mentioned that four or five times, uh, saying that's good that you're willing to talk to uh, the PCOS. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Is Sorry there... for any repetitiveness, by the way. No, no, that's fine. No, that, that, there... wasn't a cut. that wasn't a cut. If they're asking the questions and you're just repeating the answer, that's what it is, right? Um, is there any other further questions on this? Okay, if not, I do want to thank you again, Michael and Jillian, for your input and your comments. And uh, we'll be heading on over to more comments and questions and recommendations. Thank you. Okay, on the recommendation, the mover is uh, Regional Councillor Lee and Councillor Khan. Uh, and again, to remind council that this is a zoning uh, amendment application, uh, is there any uh, comments or questions to this? Um, yeah, um, so I don't know the appropriate, is it, is it uh, clerk, I, can I defer my own motion if I'm moving this? Through you, Madam Chair, uh, you can certainly withdraw your moving of the motion. Um, you can also move a deferral of it as the motion is properly on the floor, uh, regardless of whether you're the mover or not. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I'm going to I'm going to move to defer this just to the next cab meeting. I think the more time these two parties can talk this through, the less likely we're going to go through an LPAT, the more likely this project will go through without further um, hiccups. And I would require a seconder on this. Thank you. Do we have a seconder for this deferment? Uh, Councillor Khan? Okay. Um, um, Mr. Clerk, deferment is that just to time and place? Do we talk? I can never get this one right between this one, between the town and the region. I think they're both different. They are. Um, 
to the question, if there is no instruction to staff accompanying that deferral, then there is no opportunity for debate. However, if there is additional direction to staff that accompanies that deferral, uh, members can debate that instruction. Okay, so that's about as clear as mud. So, okay, so, so no, the, no the deferment, huh? Pardon? There's no debate. Okay, because the deferment came with a date, correct? Good, no okay. Correct. So uh, saying that, uh, no debate, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, so it fails. So we're back to the original motion on the rezoning. I'll just like to speak to it, Madam Chair. You yes, go ahead. And this is a tough one. I mean, the Peacocks go back a long time. I think this is their hundredth year in Ajax overall. I mean, you've major, major commitments to our community, and and definitely, I, I um, really is difficult for me to make this decision because because I do respect that, and of course, I do want to support. But at the same time, I mean, this is just a rezoning. This is just bringing it into conformity with the official plan. Uh, this isn't the actual site plan and this the traffic study really isn't relevant to this process. It's been done because there is a real site plan application on the table, but really we're just dealing with the zoning today, not the site plan application. And I do, my, my decision maker was the fact that this has been on the floor for a year. Um, adjacent landowners were circulated and I'm sure adjacent landowners were also circulated on the open house. So to have the, the um, concerns come in literally at the last minute on March 29th and April 5th. Uh, I just, um, I don't feel it's the right thing to delay this. That being said, I do think that there is about five weeks worth of time for the parties to get together and hopefully um, address any concerns that the, the PCOS might have. And if there's any way that I can facilitate that, with arranging meetings with the region or with the town or whichever else, I will. I will sit in and we'll do everything that we can to help uh, facilitate. But I also trust that the developer, the applicant, will will do that as well because I'm sure they don't want to be held up. But by delaying this for 30 days, I don't think it's going to make any of those things happen. I think they can already happen without. So um, I will be supporting this tonight and. Um, uh, I, I hope that the parties will keep me involved because I'm very interested in this and I want to see this move forward as well as any applications on any adjacent lands. I think we all feel very strongly about economic development and we want to do everything we can to help move these things forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, the chair's uh, frozen again, so I'll be taking over. Uh, are there any other questions or comments regarding the motion on the floor right now? Um, then I guess we will call a vote then. Um, all those in favor of uh, the staff recommendation um, that the zoning bylaw be approved and that implementing zoning bylaw as provided as Vermont, it's order be provided to council for its consideration at a future council meeting. All those opposed? All right, that passes. Thank you. You missed Marilyn, right? Uh, well, uh, she's not here, so I, we can't count the vote. I believe that's how that works. Um, so moving on to the next item on the agenda, we have... Um, uh, public public meeting regarding PDS 2021-12, the town initiated zoning bylaw amendment application Z1 slash 21, residential driveway standards. Director Romanowski. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Chair. Please. Um, I just want to make sure the previous motion, you moved it. So were you, is that all right for you to be the chair of it? <laughs> the vote? Um, clerk, uh, does that, is that okay? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, it's extraordinarily good timing. Um, I believe that would still be appropriate given that you moved it prior to becoming the chair. If members don't have any concerns with that, we will record it as such. Councilor Bauer, do you have any text. direct concerns? I, there? No, I, no, I, no I, issue. I, I normally just wanted do that, to make so, uh, sure that everything was okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you, uh, Clerk. So, uh, Director Romanowski. Yes. Uh, Who's chairing the meeting now? No, I'm just kidding. How oh, dare <laughs> <laughs> Who's on first? Uh, I will uh, turn uh, the mic and the video screen over to Mr. Sawchuk to walk us through 
um, the town initiated zoning bylaw amendments related to the residential driveways. We're not at adjournment yet, eh? I'm starting to get offended. I keep getting kicked out. They're just starting the uh, presentation, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sawchuck, I, if, if you're speaking, we can't hear you right now. I was in fact speaking. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll go you. back. Sorry about that. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Sawchuck and I'm a senior planner at the town of Ajax. I'll be speaking tonight on the town initiated zoning by bylaw amendment for residential driveway standards. And I will note that this meeting serves as the statutory public meeting for this zoning bylaw amendment. The meeting will be broken into several different areas. Uh, I will first discuss the project background before discussing the January 2021 background report, which was essentially made up of eight different amendment strategies. I will then spend some time discussing the consultation that has happened to date, which includes public ho open houses, uh, written correspondence that's been received, and also internal discussions between town departments. I will then focus on uh, revisions that have been made to the proposed amendment since the time of the initial background report uh, prior to making a conclusion and moving on to a discussion. So parking demands in Ajax's residential neighborhoods have been on the rise due to a couple different reasons. One is vehicle ownership, the increase in vehicle ownership rates, as well as the construction of higher density residential communities. So essentially what this has done is it's forced residents with a shortage of parking into doing one of two things, either parking on the street or altering their properties and or the town's boulevard lands in order to accommodate their vehicles. In response to this in December, 2018, council directed staff to look into two things, <clears throat> look into the ability of residents to hardscape or modify town boulevards for the purposes of landscape design and or additional parking, and also to look into the definition of driveways permitted driveway widths, and generally the ability of homeowners to expand driveways or walkways within their property lines. So as a reminder to council and those in attendance, residential driveways are actually made up of three parts. There's the driveway component, which occurs on the private property. There's then the apron, which occurs on the town's boulevard lands. And finally, the curb cut, which is the depressed area of the concrete curb connecting the driveway to the street. Any alterations referencing or relating to the apron are actually subject to the Boulevard encroachment policy, whereas any changes alongside the driveway or to the driveway are subject to the town's zoning bylaw standards, uh, which are uh, what we are speaking to tonight. So just to recap, the Boulevard encroachment policy was approved by town council in October 2020 and implemented in January 2021. The initiatives that we'll be discussing tonight were first addressed through a zoning bylaw amendment that was brought to cap in January 2021. And this cap report was uh, supported by a background report, which, as I mentioned, essentially outlined eight different strategies in order to address driveway related issues. So I will quickly recap those eight different strategies. The first was to actually revise uh, the legal requirement for space dimensions. This was taking the width down from 2.7 meters to 2.6 meters and decreasing the required length from six meters to 5.5 meters. We also propose the uncoupling of driveway and garage widths. So in the town, there are actually provisions uh, which require in some cases driveway widths not to exceed garage widths. And then this unnecessarily restricts driveway widths on many lots that are normally permitted to have wider driveways. So doing away with this would allow for wider driveways to be created in some cases. The third proposal was to align driveway uh, widths to parking space width requirements. So currently there's no consideration for legal parking dimensions when we look at maximum driveway widths. 
And this led to scenarios in several zones where the maximum driveway width is just shy of what would be required to accommodate an extra vehicle. Uh, as a result, we will be increasing these widths slightly so that they can accommodate um, a whole number of vehicles. Another proposal was to align curb cuts to driveway widths. So currently in the zoning bylaw, there are several zones where the curb cut width requirement is actually less than the driveway width. Uh, so we are looking at doing away with this. So all curb cut maximum widths will align with maximum driveway width. We are also proposing to begin regulating the number of driveway accesses to residential properties. Essentially, we would allow for one driveway access to any residential property, with the exception being properties in the country residential zone, where two separate accesses would be permitted. And we would actually be reconsidering entirely how we consider driveways in the country residential zone. The reason for this is uh, the, the maximum width strategy just doesn't really align with the types of driveways we see there. And because of the large size of these properties, it's not the most appropriate measure. So in the CR zone, we would actually look to implement a percentage requirement whereby we would permit up to 30% of a front yard to be covered by a driveway and up to 10% of the aggregate of the rear and side yards to be covered by a driveway. We are also looking to implement new hard landscaping measures uh, that would prevent hard landscaping right up to side and rear lot lines. So the intention of this would be to ensure that surfaces within 0.6 meters of a lot line were to remain as permeable surfaces. And the last and most significant proposal that was made was to delineate walkways from driveways. So this would introduce new standards to allow for walkways to be constructed alongside driveways. And these would be permitted to have a maximum width of 1.8 meters on the side nearest the main entrance and 0.6 meters on the opposite side of the driveway. Now in each case where a walkway was constructed, it must be visually delineated from the driveway through a change in material, color, or layout or pattern. So these eight measures were taken forward uh, to a public open house that occurred on February 9th. We actually conducted two open houses on that date, one during the afternoon and one during the evening to accommodate uh, as many participants as possible. Uh, what we saw during those open houses were that many of the concerns and many of the questions were actually specific to people's own personal properties. So where that was the case, we took those discussions offline, <coughs> excuse me, and had staff address those separately. Uh, with that said, there were a few uh, general conversation topics that came up that were more broad in their applicability. Those related to vehicle overhang onto sidewalks and roadways, uh, the use of garages for storage versus for parking, and also impacts that the proposed amendment could have on new construction. We have also been receiving written correspondence throughout this process. And this has been submitted both via the IMO page and directly to staff. Uh, again, what we've seen in many situations is people are um, providing questions to the town about their personal situations with their properties. So we have provided direct responses in those instances. Where we have had more general comments, uh, they have been very similar in nature to those that were discussed for the public open house. And if people are uh, interested in seeing uh, the details of these questions, they are included within the report, or sorry, as an appendix to the report uh, within a comment matrix. Upon providing notice of this meeting, uh, we started to receive even more written submissions. So in the last couple of weeks, we've received approximately another dozen written submissions. And from these, we can take a few general themes. Uh, the first is that there, there does seem to be general support uh, from property owners in terms of being able to make decisions uh, that would increase the parking supply for their properties. However, with that said, uh, we have also heard from several residents about concerns that this uh, amendment could have on streetscape aesthetics. And another uh, area of interest was about uh, how we could look into actually requiring even more public, or sorry, not public, more parking spaces uh, for new developments as they come online. 
So we also use the time between the open houses and tonight's meeting to consult with various staff in different town departments. And this has been very fruitful in terms of looking at the originally proposed amendment and recognizing any potential issues. And uh, I think our, our conversations with bylaw have been quite productive uh, as they have pointed to a number of um, provisions within the, the first version of the amendment uh, that there were issues that needed to be addressed. So I'll spend the next couple of slides looking at some of the revisions that have been made between the initial amendment back in uh, initial draft amendment back in January to what has um, has come before us tonight. Essentially, these revisions can be grouped into three large categories, the first being general amendment updates and revisions. Uh, so for example, upon going through the zoning bylaw again, we noticed that some of the provisions that we were looking to amend in the main body of the uh, bylaw were also repeated within the exceptions uh, at the end of the bylaw. So we've gone through and ensured that there is alignment uh, in all of those cases between what will now appear in the main body and what appears in the site specific exemptions at the end. Uh, there were also instances where we came across information um, that was somewhat redundant. So there were a few instances where we were able to cut information entirely because it really had no bearing on the standards that were being proposed. The second area of uh, revisions that have been made to the amendment relate to the original permeable buffer requirement. The discussion with bylaw raised uh, potential difficulties in actually regulating what is permeable and what is not permeable. So we've taken this and we've actually transitioned to the original permeable buffer setback into a driveway setback, which would be applicable to interior side lot lines. And what we are considering now is rather than the 0.6 standard that was considered previously, we're looking at a 0.3 standard, um, which aligns with the standard included in the boulevard encroachment policy. And its main intent is just to ensure that you don't have driveways going right up to the property line and creating issues with encroachments and, and car, car doors opening onto uh, adjacent properties and that sort of thing. So ensuring some separation there is a positive thing. Uh, it also has other consequences in terms of, uh, in many instances, preserving areas for drainage and natural sways, swales, as well as uh, infiltration of stormwater. The last revision that we made to the amendment, relate, to the amendment relates to walkway details. Uh, and this is because the amendment uh, originally did not include provisions to permit uh, parking on the walkways. And there is a section of the zoning bylaw, section 5.6, that actually restricts parking anywhere in a front yard except for on the driveway. So it was very important for us to go back into this section and make amendments so that we could explicitly state that parking would be permitted on these driveway adjacent walkways. We also made some minor tweaks to the language that was being used. So for example, we decided to introduce a new definition for driveway adjacent walkway. And the benefit to this is that it helps to distinguish walkways that can actually be parked on and walkways that cannot be parked on. Uh, so we also had to modify the proposed footnote slightly. And the new footnote reads that where a driveway adjacent walkway intersects at grade with a hard landscaping surface other than a driveway, the connection point between the two must not exceed a maximum width of 1.5 meters. So it's not that easy to understand in text, uh, but hopefully the visual here will help to explain what that means. So in this example here, the driveway adjacent walkway is the area uh, that's colored in blue. Parking would be allowed on this surface. However, it would not be allowed on this adjacent walkway that is colored in pink here. So what this 1.5 meter restriction point actually does is it provides a physical barrier from cars uh, from actually traversing from where they are allowed to be parked onto other walkways where they shouldn't be parked. So as an example, this is an existing scenario uh, that would be permitted under the proposed amendment. Uh, you have the driveway adjacent walkway in blue. 
And then you see here that the connection to the walkway that leads in behind to the backyard is less than 1.5 meters. So obviously it's not large enough for a vehicle to, to traverse and park somewhere in this area. By contrast, here is an example where we have a connection point that's greater than 1.5 meters. And uh, the, as you can see, the issue with these large connections is that they do provide room for vehicles uh, to pass onto walkways where vehicle parking would not be permitted. So that is why we had to uh, implement this 1.5 meter restriction point. So in conclusion, the standards in the proposed zoning or town initiated zoning bylaw amendment will assist the town in achieving various objectives, including the alleviation of on-street parking issues and the provision of more flexibility to property owners. The proposed amendment before you represents a fair solution that balances increased parking with streetscape preservation. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Sachuk. Uh, Mayor Collier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Mr. Sawchuk. I'm so glad to see this come forward. If everybody recalls, this was one of the first things we did after the last election because we had, I think it was 250 outstanding uh, complaints and I'm not, I won't call it charges, infractions that bylaw. It was that the right amount, Mr. Sawchuk, approximately? Uh, through the chair to you, Mr. Mayor, yes, uh, that's in the ballpark of how many infractions there were. Okay, and, and we recognize, of course, the fact, and this is even more um, needed due to COVID and more people working from home, but we recognize the fact that things have changed, more, more adult children are living at home, there's more multifamilies, there's more rental basements, there's more um, other type of uses, and we need to to allow for more parking. I'm very glad to see that. Two questions. One, on the center of the driveways, one of the things that was not allowed in the first draft was River Rock, which I'm hoping has been amended as a permeable. I know you've changed the wording on what permeable means, um, but I'm hoping they have made that amendment that, that River Rock is no longer uh, not an allowable product to be used. So through the chair. Uh... There, there has never been any reference to River Rock for the driveways component of this project. So anything, uh, as, it, as it relates to private property, we've never had an issue with River Rock. Where River Rock came up was actually in the boulevard encroachment policy. Okay. So I, the, that policy, which has now been approved and has moved forward through the implementation of the amendments to the road occupancy bylaw, uh, it does state that uh, River Rock is not a permitted material for use in the town's boulevard. Right. Uh, no, I was talking about in between the two driveways. So that narrow strip that has been reduced to 0.3 meters. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So in, in that yeah. case, uh, we do not specify okay. what, uh, what material goes in there. So as long as it's not, uh, the, the setback of 0.3 meters applies to driveways and to driveway adjacent walkways it doesn't relate to anything else. So property owners uh, would be within their rights to place River Rock in that area. Good, and of the 250 uh, that the report doesn't speak to enforcement. So of the 250 that um, we had before, how many would be satisfied and how many would still be outstanding and what would happen to those that are still outstanding? So the vast majority uh, would be, um, uh, would be permitted through these amendments. These amendments would create a scenario whereby those were legal. Uh, unfortunately, there are still uh, quite a few. I don't have specific numbers, uh, but I, I would think at least a couple dozen uh, where the alterations that they made were so vast in terms of their scope um, that some revisions would be, would be required to bring them into compliance. So that could be addressed uh, either one of two ways. The first would be to make uh, physical modifications to ensure that whatever is currently on the property is in compliance with the new standards. The other would be to look to tools such as um, a minor variance, for example, uh, to bring their situation into conformity. 
All right. Well, let's hope that uh, there's there's not too many and we can satisfy those and move forward. I'm really happy to see this. Thank you to you and thank you to all staff and bylaw and planning for all your hard work on this and happy to support it when it comes forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Khan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mike, for this for all the hard work you guys did on this. So one, one messaging we've been giving to our residents is always use your garage to park your cars to avoid illegal parking. One thing I have noticed um, since I've been in Ajax, most of the houses I've been in, or my houses at least, even though there are two car garages, you can only park one car because the builders have put this extension within the second car where the second car should go and you really can't fit a car in the other side. So maybe I think builders should understand that they need to, you know, if you're selling a, a house with two cars, two cars garages, you should at least make sure the cars can fit in the garage. Um, so Mike, um, during, the, during the pandemic, a lot, of, a lot of driveways and a lot of houses in, in North Ajax, especially I can speak for, have done a lot of work on their, on their driveways. And um, some of them might be not up to compliance. Uh, when do you assume, or when do you think these uh, these new these new regulations will be in place? And the second part of that is, how do we let our residents know if they have to do any kind of variations to their to their driveways? Can you speak on that a bit, please? Sure. So through the chair to Councillor Khan, uh, in terms of the timing, I'll start with that. Uh, so if Council does support uh, the amendments before them tonight, uh, that would move forward for ratification at Council on uh, April 19th. Uh, we could then get notice out uh, referencing this, uh, this approval, and there would be a 20-day um, appeal period that follows that. Now, assuming there are there will be no appeals, uh, this everything could go live as soon as early May. I believe May 10th would be the first date. Um, so as I said, that does assume no appeals. That's sort of a best case scenario. Uh, but if that is the way that it does play out, that will mean that we'll have the new driveway amendments in place as well as the existing boulevard encroachment policy. So we'll be able to take a more holistic approach and ensure that all of these properties uh, do adhere to both, uh, both sets of these rules. Now, in terms of your second question, uh, I'm sorry, could I get you to repeat the second portion? How do we inform our residents if variations has to be made or repairs or changes has to be made to their, their current driveways? Sure, so uh, anywhere that there's an existing infraction, uh, bylaw has been in contact with those property owners. And once these things are passed, uh, they will be notified uh, of the new rules and informed of whether or not uh, they do need to make any revisions. Uh, so those are the, the cases I think we need to be most concerned with where there are existing infractions. Beyond that, we also need to engage in a bit of a uh, public education campaign to ensure that people do know exactly what they are permitted to do moving forward. So I will be working with um, our teams in bylaw as well as communications in order to bring together some materials so that we can make this information uh, as simple and straightforward as possible. Because as you guys are aware, uh, after sitting through a number of these presentations, this is a very technical matter. Um, so we'll, we'll rely quite heavily, I would say, on the skills of our communications team to, to make this quite understandable to residents. Thank you, because yeah, I, I'm pretty confused. It's not very clear to me what the changes are. And I have some idea, but yeah, any, any resident were to ask me a question, I'd have to come to bylaw and to you and ask you what the answers are. Uh, one last question, sorry, if you'll have me, Madam Chair. Um, are there costs affiliated with these uh, changes? So there are no costs uh, in terms of, um, you know, financial costs to the town. Uh, this, is, this is a very straightforward amendment um, that really just, you know, the end result for the town is revisions to the, the zoning bylaw. There may be costs to property owners. Um, you know, as I mentioned to the mayor, there may be some situations where even with these amendments, certain properties still not, do not meet the requirements. In those cases, property owners may decide um, 
rather than moving forward with the minor variants, they may decide that it's in their best interest to make some physical modifications to their existing property. And that obviously will come along with costs to them. To them. Thank you, Mr. Sachuk. You've been uh, very thorough with your explanations. Much appreciated. Thank You're you, welcome. Madam Chair. Councilor Tyler Morin. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Sachuk. This is, I want to echo what uh, my colleague, uh, Councilor Khan just said. There's 30,000 driveways in Ajax. There's a thousand streets. I'm really concerned about, I'm really happy this came through and we need it. Uh, there's some residents who don't want it. There's some residents who need it really badly, but everyone can agree that there's parked cars all over the streets right now. We need to get things tucked away. Uh, residential intensification has once again reared its head. And that's really what we're dealing with here, uh, ultimately, because more people needed to buy expensive homes, takes more people to pay the mortgage, kids are living at home, all the reasons that you've already stated. But I am worried about enforcement. I'm worried about education. You've addressed them both. Um, I know that some people are very stick sticklers. They do exactly what they're told. I just don't want all of a sudden all our streets to look like a big giant mess. And again, this is a very complex, as you framed it, technical um, area that we have to deal with now. But I can tell you that there's a lot of residents that have opinions on this. So I hope bylaw is not going to be over bear you know like i hope they can deal with this i hope communications can deal with this i guess i'm asking or just giving more comments than questions but i do have some serious concerns about how this is all going to roll out and make sure that it's uh, it's done properly but i have confidence i'm just saying this is a tricky one we've, we've got to make sure we have uh, a lot of support when this gets released or else we're going to have a big mess and use up a ton of resources thank you so through, through the chair to Councillor Tyler Morin, um, <clears throat> just one of the really interesting observations I was able to make through this process is we have definitely seen people on both sides of the debate. Uh, we've seen some that essentially don't want any regulations in terms of their driveways and want to be able to do whatever they feel is necessary in terms of driveway expansions. We've also heard from a number of residents who are saying, you know, we need to be really concerned here about aesthetics. And I don't want to be looking out my window at, you know, a huge paved surface that just looks like a, a parking lot. Uh, a lot of the comments that we have received to date have complemented the work that we've done so far based on the fact that this does seem to be a bit of a balancing act. And we have been able to accommodate the ability to create more parking spaces while still doing it in a way that won't detract from the physical or, or the, the aesthetics, I should say, of streetscapes. So I think we have landed somewhere in the middle, um, which really was our attention from the outside of this project. Yeah, and if I may, uh, 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 Madam Chair, I totally agree, Michael. It, it's a great report and there's a lot of great things in it. The whole thing is great. It's just executing it and making sure the education or uh, part of it is, is really well done because I don't want to see every driveway hardscape and when the rain comes, it doesn't have a place to go under the ground. For the environment it's just got to be done right but anyways i don't mean to be debbie downer on this uh, i'm glad it's here i was a proponent of this and uh thank you so much we'll, we'll get this done just have to work hard on it thank you thank you um is there any other questions or comments to mr sawchuk i just wanted to say i think it would be cool if we could get like um like a before and after uh kind of what it was before and what it is now like a real almost like a cheat sheet for driveways now but that's just my comment. I think it it really does need to be, it's a very technical, uh, like you said, a very technical piece. And uh, sometimes if it's too hard to understand, people just won't read it and won't do it. And then they end up in trouble. But anyway, thank you. You went through an awful lot of work. And yes, we sat through some open houses. And uh, so thank you very much for your work. And I think we have a recommendation that is moved by Councillor Collier or sorry, Councillor Collier, I just demoted you. Mayor Collier and Councillor uh, Tyler Morin, do we, can we get that on the screen, uh, um, Alec? Thank you, sir. I'm not reading all of this because we'll be here for days. So uh, moved by Mayor Collier, seconded by Councillor, oh, did you want to say something, Mayor Collier? Voting. Okay, all in favor. Oh, Madam Chair, before yeah. we...
proceed to voting. This is a public meeting item and we do oh. have a delegate registered for this item. I'm so sorry. Yes, you're correct. Okay, you have a delegate. Thank you. We have Jamie Butler with us tonight. Oh, okay. Jamie, you go ahead with your delegation. You have five minutes. Once you hit unmute. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, very, very happy to see all of this coming forward. Um, I've been a resident in Ajax since 19, uh, 1994. Um, watched the, the, the city grow. I've watched West New Road increased from two lanes to four lanes going north of Kingston Road, past what used to be the Cashway Lumberyard, et cetera. Uh, just exponential growth in Ajax. And uh, parking, unfortunately, has been one of the issues in my opinion that has been overlooked um, more so in the the newer subdivisions. I'm in, in, in an older area, the streets are a little bit wider, um, but parking is still an issue in my area as far as on-street parking. Uh, more than two or three vehicles at a home where there's only parking for, for uh, one or two. Um, I applaud the the uh, town's town's comments about having the homeowners clean out their drive their uh, garages and use them for their vehicles. Uh, there are people that have have chosen to turn their garages into living space. That's that's their prerogative. Um, with regards to the the um, proposed amendments for for driving and widening, I, I'm all for it. I think it's fantastic. My, my only comments are, I have um, noted in the past that there, there are residents that have gone ahead and made alterations to the property, which I don't believe had been approved. I have brought this forward to, to by law and I do not believe they've been addressed as of yet. My understanding is that there is a, a, a freeze on, on uh, bylaw visits right now because of the uh, proposed amendment and and probably something to do with COVID as well. But uh, I just wanted my two cents to say thank you very much for bringing this forward. And uh, long story short, I would like to see whatever the the amendments are to, to have them enforced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Butler. I just wanted to let you know that I believe it's as of June uh, we also have uh, bylaw will be doing more uh, proactive uh, parking enforcement as opposed to reactive parking in enforcement. And I believe that starts in June. We did have a pause on that because of COVID and people working from home and with this uh, driveway bylaw coming into effect. So that should uh, satisfy some of the concerns that you have. Um, because uh, people will be getting tickets and it won't be, uh, we won't have to rely on residents complaining. Or I don't mean complaining, but offering <laughs> suggestions to bylaw. Reporting. Reporting, yes. <laughs> reporting. That's a better yeah. word. Reporting, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not sure if that helps you or not. Well, the, the, the overnight parking, um, specifically around my my particular address uh, had has been an ongoing issue for for years and and when I I, I do um, report it it does get actioned upon sometimes uh, but your your comments about the the enforcement being more proactive than reactive I'm, I'm very much in favor of that thank you very much Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments to Mr. Butler? If not, I wanna thank you very much for taking time out tonight to come and, uh, and make your delegation to council. Have a great evening and stay safe. Thank you very much and to you as well. Thank you. I think now we're at the recommendation. Uh, all in favor? If no other questions or comments, all in favor? Opposed? That passes. Thank you very much. All right, we're on to our next. Okay, this is Sean. Sean McCullough, hey. is that right? 
There he is. Okay, Sean, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, just gonna bring up my presentation. Just give me one moment. All right, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Sean McCullough. I'm the Supervisor of Planning Policy and Research for the town. Uh, tonight, I'm just gonna give a very brief presentation. I know uh, some of these comments have been brought forward to council before, so uh, I'll try to keep it short. So on February 17th, the province released an ERO posting on the Environmental Registry of Ontario for a 61 day comment period ending on April 19th. The posting seeks feedback on growing the green belt with a focus on two areas, uh, the Paris Galt Moraine, as well as urban river valleys. The province includes several principles to be considered in the consultation, which include that no land will be considered for the removal or exchange, no changes to the existing greenbelt policies will be considered. Lands to be added that support the greenbelt's objectives, vision, and goals. Any amendments to the plan will follow the existing process outlined in the Greenbelt Act. Any lands to be considered must be physically or functionally connected. And it must consider provincial priorities such as growth management, protection of natural heritage, water resource systems, and agricultural resources, as well as any infrastructure. So first, as mentioned, one of the focus areas is the Paris Galt Moraine. Uh, and this stretches from Erin through Guelph and Cambridge down to Brantford. The moraine is similar to the Oak Ridges Moraine and consists of sand and gravel deposits. It acts as the watershed divide and headwaters for many creeks within the Grand River and Credit River watersheds. It uh, is also traversed by the Mill Creek and Aramosa River Blue Springs Creek subwatersheds. While staff don't have any specific comments on the study area, staff recommend the council support in principle the goal of supporting headwaters and this important geological feature. Next, there are 21 urban river valleys that currently connect the Greenbelt to inland lakes such as Lake Ontario. In Ajax, this includes the Carruthers Creek as well as the Duffins Creek. Uh, which have the urban river valley designation applied to them. And this follows an approximate 60 meter uh, offset from the edge of the creek. It should be noted that the urban river valley policies only apply to lands in public ownership and do not apply to lands in private ownership. The urban river valley designation also identifies that the lands governed by official plan policies that have regard for uh, the Greenbelt plan. The Ajax official plan has a comprehensive policy framework designed to protect, restore, and enhance the natural heritage and key hydrologic features. It also outlines vegetation protection zones and strives to acquire environmental protection lands into public ownership. Staff are recommending that the Urban River Valley designation be aligned with the environmental protection designation or similar designation in the region's official plan and local official plans. In the Ajax context, this would re represent more of a symbolic move as the environmental protection policies in the Ajax official plan currently apply and are more detailed. So just to give you an example, on the left we have, uh, this is a portion of the Carruthers Creek uh, just south of Bailey Street uh, adjacent to the Wobbler Swamp. Uh, so on the left you can see the urban river valley designation and the 60 meter offset from either side of the creek. And then on the right, uh, we have the existing environmental protection designation outlined in the Ajax official plan. And this would just, uh, we're looking, recommending that the two be aligned. And again, these policies would only apply to lands under public ownership. Uh, finally, uh, the province has asked for additional ideas uh, to grow the green belt. So staff have included comments recommending that the province grow the green belt by adding the white belt lands in Northeast Pickering this donut hole is surrounded entirely by green belt. The addition of almost 2,300 hectares of land would protect the headwaters of the Crothers Creek, containing many natural heritage features and key hydrologic features and areas. It would limit urban development in the area and would reduce impact from flooding identified in the draft Crothers Creek watershed plan and reduce erosion and improve water quality. It would protect prime agricultural land and it would improve habitat for endangered species, such as the red side dace. And with that, as I mentioned, it would be a short presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Good 
Do we lose Marilyn again? I think I'm here. Have. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I'm here. My word. Okay. Call <laughs> your. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. McCullough. I'll tr I'll try and be brief in my comments. It's getting late. Uh, I I've looked into this because I want some clarification. So just let me pull up the recommendation, and I, I support the Urban River Valley System um, to be no problem. But two A, I just want some clarification, and and you kind of gave it in your presentation. When we talk about incorporating the white belt lands surrounding the headwaters of Carruthers Creek to protect natural heritage and hydrological features and areas, I want to just get that so I understand it completely and everybody understands it completely because I think that's a wording that came out of Councillor Dive's motion from March 22nd where we directed staff to, to make these comments. So when we talk about white belt lands, are we talking about collectively the 4,000 acres around that that surround the headwaters or are you talking about the portion of lands that surround the headwaters of the Carruthers with their setback as required by the TRCA which is about 300 or so acres. Uh, so through the chair to Mayor Collier so when we speak to the the white belt uh, we're speaking to all of the lands up in the, in the headwaters of this area. So it would include both those hydrologic and key natural heritage features, which are the creeks themselves, they're the wetlands, uh, they're forested areas, those types of things, as well as the key hydrologic areas, which can be uh, significant groundwater recharge areas and other uh, important areas that are important to supporting the watershed. Okay. Uh, so we're talking about the entire amount. Now, this council has passed similar motions several times requesting over the last two terms, at least maybe three terms of council, uh, requesting that the, the white belt lands, which, which encompasses all 4,000 acres, be included in the green belt, and we have not been successful. Is it necessary to have all 4,000 acres included in the green belt to protect South Ajax from flooding? or is it just needed to protect the areas around the headwaters specifically? And I ask this because honestly, I can't see this government putting this entire amount in the green belt. It's too many jobs. It's too much residential. It's, it's too much money on the table. I just can't see it happening. If we're gonna make recommendations, I would prefer to make recommendations that have a reasonable expectation of happening. So to me, as long as we protect those lands that actually make up the headwaters, are we not protecting South Ajax and the downtown? And, and sorry, and the downstream. Uh, so through the chair to Mayor Collier. So if you are protecting the, the key hydrologic uh, features and some of the, nat the key natural heritage features that surround those areas, um, as was identified in the Crowley Creek Watershed Plan, there would be mitigation that would be needed as part of the management recommendations, and that would go along uh, to achieving some of those downstream flooding concerns. Uh, what I would say was it was identified in the Crowley Creek Watershed Plan that all the sub watersheds in the scenario three scenario, uh, which includes urban development of the headwaters, uh, saw deteriorating um, conditions both from water quality perspective uh, to uh, deteriorating natural heritage system and um, habitat. Um, so that's where some of these other protections go along. Um, I think that answers your question, but I'm happy to elaborate on anything if you like. Well, it, it kind of answers my question. Um, you, I'm pretty sure were present when TRCA made their, made their presentation to council I, it must have been over a year ago because I think it was in council chambers regarding the Carruthers watershed plan. And I think you heard me ask them why if modern stormwater management practices are required under the act on all developments, why those modern requirements were not used when they were doing the um, scenarios under the plan. Right. And, and I ask that because I feel that the recommendations or their what they're saying will happen if some things happen are probably 
not realistic given that whatever development happens there, if any development happens there, it will have to have modern stormwater management. Is that accurate? Like it, whatever happens, they will have to put in modern stormwater management to the hydrological studies, whatever they're called, which have not been done. Is that correct? Uh, so through the chair, so they've, they've done the first step in identifying the level of flooding that could be expected. And then you're correct. There would be another step that would go along that would use the detailed land uses to determine where those hydraulic flood lines are. And then that would get used to uh, plan for other mitigation measures and items like that. The study that they've done to date, though, they do look at, at an uncontrolled scenario because in this situation, the regional storm event is, is what is of concern. And that scenario currently assumes that um, all of your stormwater management ponds are full, your ground is saturated, and that's where the flooding is going to occur. Um, so that was one item where they were looking at potentially requiring regional stormwater controls, which are currently not um, used frequently or, or require further approval by the province. Um, so that's those would have to come out of it, and though they've been identified as management recommendations in in the Corellis Creek watershed plan. Uh, what we've done today in our comments is we feel that uh, our recommendation is just reflective of some of the objectives of the Greenbelt plan. And that's why we've recommended the entire area. Um, but it, certainly any way you look at it, you could look at um, if, if there were other areas to be protected or what would be added to the Greenbelt plan. Okay. And, and just further on the Corellis watershed, no decisions have been made. We've just gone through the public process no decisions have been made. So we don't actually know what scenario is gonna be chosen of the three. Uh, I mean, so oh. us making our recommendations without knowing that, I, I, I don't know how effective that is versus we know, I've seen the Varane plan, I've seen the Varane development plan, and I've seen how the headwaters are protected in that plan. And I guess my question is, I personally would rather make sure that those, we always talked about protecting the headwaters. It's all about protecting the headwaters, right? That's been the mantra for the last couple of terms of council. That's what I want to do. Um, so given that, and I know staff reached out to you earlier today, I think this wording came from you. Would it not make more sense that just instead of making a broad statement of the white belt lands, which is open to interpretation because it says the white belt lands, but I had to ask specifically whether that's all the lands or just the lands around the headwaters. To use the wording that's in the actual Carruthers watershed plan, which is replace 2A with incorporating the white belt lands surrounding the headwaters of the Carruthers Creek to protect natural heritage and hydrologic features and areas which is what's actually in the TRCA Carruthers Watership Plan. Would that not be more specific and perhaps target a little bit more in your opinion? So through the chair to Mayor Collier. So if, as I mentioned, we put forward a recommendation to include the entire area because we think that that aligns with the objectives of the um, the Greenbelt Plan, it would also go a step further and protect those key hydrologic areas um, which would not be captured when you're just protecting. It becomes very difficult to um, target those areas because they, they cover much larger areas and they're important for uh, groundwater to infiltrate and support the base flow of the creek. Um, however, if there was a desire, and this is an approach that's used elsewhere for um, some other areas in, in the GTA and White Belt where the actual features, the key natural heritage features and hydrologic features are protected in the green belt and then the white belt remains out of those areas. Um, as I mentioned, staffers have put forward the recommendations before you because we, we do still feel that that aligns with the green belt objectives, um, but it certainly would be up to the province to make those decisions. Um, I guess just my last question, given I mean, the hydrological study the net hasn't been done. So how do we know what those areas are? And how can we identify them and accurately say, we want to do this if that study hasn't been done and we don't know what those areas actually are? 
Uh, so through the chair to Mayor Collier. So those studies were done as part of the watershed plan. Um, okay. You can see it in my report, I included some What's figures. What's the one that's not done? What's the next one that's yeah. not done? So that's the one we always get the wording confused. It's the hydraulic analysis. So that's, that's just where you're one. actually, yeah, that's the one where you're actually just looking at where the flood lines are and what properties would be impacted downstream. Okay, so that wouldn't affect this. That's correct. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, that is a motion I, I probably will bring later, Madam Chair, but I just wanted to um, ask about that wording. Thank you. Thank you, Regional Councillor Lee. Um, sorry, I think I'll, I thought the mayor was gonna introduce the motion now. I'll save my comments, uh, thank you. Regional Councillor Dyes. Thank you, and uh, I just wanted to uh, thank staff for bringing this forward. I requested this, um, these comments uh, to go to the ER, on the ERO in the, um, for, for the province who is considering growing the green belt. I thought it was really, really important We've been pretty consistent with our message so far. Isn't that correct, Sean? Pardon me? We've been pretty, Mr. McCullough, we've been pretty oh. consistent <laughs> over the years with the same message that we incorporate the white lands around the headwaters. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Dyes, that's correct. It, it's more of a copy and paste exercise in the report. And, and I believe too that we identified um, the problems, a spill area, I think it was going back to flood mapping in 2010. Do we have a copy of the map of the spill area and that affects the lower Ajax in the old area by Paradise Beach? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Councillor Dyes, if I, I can just pull up my presentation one more time, just included something at the end just to help illustrate this. So if everyone can see that. So this is uh, an illustration of the lower Carruthers uh, where it uh, bends around the Pickering Beach neighborhood. Um, so normally water would follow this, the Carruthers Creek towards this blue area, uh, blue arrow uh, towards Lake Ontario. Um, you're correct, yeah. In 2007, there was first identified that there would be likely be a spill. And then through our further analysis and the environmental assessment, uh, it was confirmed. Uh, the red lines that you see here, these are current the current uh, regional flood lines that have been uh, determined by the Toronto Region Conservation Authority uh, using their modeling um, based on current approved land uses in Ajax and Pickering. Um, so if there were additional land uses in the northern headwaters that were unmitigated, that's where uh, you would start to see these flood lines start to change and they would be reevaluated through that process. So at, at the time when we went through this process, there was discussion about putting a berm, I think it was just a little bit south of Rolo, um, to like a, like a dike in a way, like a big berm to mitigate some of that flooding. Is that correct too? Because I'm getting the impression that the, the TRC has changed their mind on that in that if the headwaters of the Carruthers is built, the berm would not be sufficient. Uh, so through the chair to, to councillor, regional councillor dies. Um, so cur the current EA that was completed, you're correct, it did identify, and it's actually in this location where this arrow is located. Um, the preferred solution in the EA identified that there would be a landform structure that constructed on this location, as well as some dredging that would have to take place in, in the uh, creek itself. Uh, to enhance or increase the capacity in the area. Um, now, under the current land use scenarios, that would resolve this flood flooding issue or the potential for a flood in this regional flood line. Um, if there's development in the headwaters, so the, what the Carruthers Creek Watershed Plan has put forward is that if there's development approved through the regional official plan in the headwaters of the Carruthers, that the environmental assessment would have to be reopened um, based on previous modeling that was completed. It was identified that yes, if development were to occur in the headwaters, 
that the, the berm or the landform would be overtopped with floodwaters and there would have to be other solutions uh, that get examined through that process. Um, so that is one of the management recommendations that would have to be completed and there would obviously be costs associated with completing that work. And the cost would be paid by whom? That, that is to be determined. Um, so staff, staff have put forward comments that it should not be on the Ajax taxpayer, um, but that would still have to be determined in consultation with the region, um, potentially the city of Pickering, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. There would be discussions that would have to have be had. So if whether it's a berm or whether there's other, other mitigation that needs to be done, I mean, we're going to bear some of that cost. And usually it is the municipality, if I'm correct, that, that bears those costs. Uh, through the charity regional council dies, that's correct. It, it's currently our, our issue. We would have to resolve it. Um, but you know, that could be worsened by other um, development outside of our boundaries. Well, I, I thank you for the information. Um, I guess to the, the other concern I have is um, obviously with climate change, we, we are seeing more floods as we get more intense rainfall and actually snow melts at, at the same time. Um, and, and that increases the risk as well, which I believe was all sort of built into PRCA's watershed plan. Uh, three Madam Chair Regional Council Dice, that's correct. They did uh, look at some climate change modeling into the Carothers Creek watershed plan. So any kind of development that would happen on the headwaters, as Mayor Collier was saying, would have to incorporate stormwater management, um, whether it's a stormwater management pond or whatever type, type of infrastructure there is. Um, once that development has been completed, and who is responsible for maintaining and replacing that infrastructure as it ages? Uh, so through the chair to regional councillor die. So if the infrastructure within the headwaters, the infrastructure would be located in the city of Pickering. So the city of Pickering would be responsible uh, to maintain those, that infrastructure. There may of course be some infrastructure on private property, uh, which we often see in condo uh, type applications. Um, those would be the condo corp, but for the most part, the larger infrastructure um, would be re the responsibility of the city of Pickering and Ajax would be responsible if there was any infrastructure required in Ajax. So for, for flooding then, um, there's costs to show associated with that as well. And I believe the federal government, and I should have checked this, before. I think they, they have funding available for relocation in some instances and, and cleanups. Um, but do they, I guess they only um, grant that money when there is an, an emergency. Do they also relocate um, if there are, are flooding events that are frequent? There are homes that are constantly being flooded and it's obvious you need to be moved or, or relocated, do they look at that? Uh, through the chair to regional councillor dies, that's, that's a question that I don't have the answer to offhand. I would imagine that there may be some funding, um, but I, unfortunately I don't have the answer to that, that question for you. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate your answers. It's been helpful. Councillor Tyler Morin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question to you, Mr. Sawchuk, through the chair is procedurally, if you see it's Northeast Pickering, the actual lands we're speaking of is Northeast Pickering and Northwest Whitby. I'm just wondering with the province, I think ultimately having the autonomy over this whole discussion, having complete autonomy, and they're asking for our comments, submitting our comments. So do we know the position of, this, of the city of Pickering and the town of Whitby and their position on this? Are they saying, to protect that whole area as well um, as, as what's being proposed tonight. Do, do you know that? Yeah, through the chair to uh, Councillor Tyler Morin. Uh, so Pickering has put forward comments that they do, that they would not support that. They're in the position that uh, they'd like to see the municipal comprehensive 
review of the region's official plan fall, uh, take place. Um, so they have not identified uh, that they're in support of it. And you're correct, it, at this point, these are just our comments to the province and the province would be responsible for making any of those decisions. And certainly they would need to consult with the city of Pickering. And Whippy, uh, North, Northwest Whippy, I would imagine. Anyway, if, I, I'm just, okay. I just didn't know if you said to us, you were gonna say, oh, actually Whippy said this, Pickering said this, but that's not the case. No, the, the city of Pickering is not supportive and the region has also indicated that they'd like to see the municipal comprehensive review uh, follow through. Right. Well, I hope they're listening when we, uh, whatever we end up doing. Thank you. Is there any other comments or questions to staff? Uh, Mayor Collier. Thank you, Chair. Not to staff, but I would like to move that amendment. I just want to give everybody the chance to ask their questions so I didn't stifle debate. So if everybody's done, I, I wouldn't mind the floor to do that. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Clerk, did you say we have a delegation that requires two thirds here? Is that the time we would do it now? Yes, Madam Chair, we do have one delegation request on this item. Uh, this is not a public meeting item, so it would require a rule suspension to accept the delegation. I think it would be appropriate to hear from the delegate before any amendments or the main motion is brought forward. Okay, uh, two thirds is, okay, um, <laughs> but thank you, Sterling. <laughs> um, my everything is unstable, as you can tell. Uh, so in favor of suspending the rules, that's what I'm doing, right, Mr. Clerk? You'll require a mover and a seconder first. I move we suspend the rules, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, seconder? Uh, Councillor Bauer, thank you. All in favor? That's enough. Okay. Our thank delegate you. tonight is Mr. Matthew Corey. Welcome, Matthew. And you have five minutes as soon as you unmute. I have unmuted. I would, there I, you go. I would, I would turn on my I would turn on my video, but I, I'm not able to do that. Okay. Um, but, but thank you, Madam Chair, and 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 thank you, um, all members of the committee, for allowing me to speak tonight. I know it's um, <clears throat> not typical that uh, we'd be uh, I'd be allowed outside of a public meeting. Um, I, uh, I'm the planner and I'm a land use planner with a plan firm alone given Parsons and I'm, <clears throat> I represent the Northeast Pickering landowners group. Um, so there are a collection of owners in uh, that white belt area that you're um, being recommended by staff to consider comments to put into the green belt. Um, it, it's obviously our um, request that you consider removing recommendation 2A um, from the report uh, and when you proceed to adopt it. Um, I've heard all the comments, I've been listening all night. Um, I, I will say these things, uh, certainly some of the comments that Mayor Collier has made, uh, we echo <clears throat> and we have similar concerns with. Um, the Northeast Pickering Landers Group has been a participant in, and has been committed to work with the region, local municipalities, and conservation authorities through the entire study process. Um, and through that extensive work and participation, particularly in the TRCA's Carruthers Creek Watershed Plan, um, it, there's been a lot of comment and, and submissions made, but we've also noted and have uh, identified for them uh, a number of concerns and issues that have to be uh, finalized and fixed prior to the finalization of that plan. And, and let's be clear here that that plan is a draft right now for out for comment and consideration. Um, and, you know, it, based on the study work that the group has done, we're confident that both community and employment growth can be accommodated in Northeast Pickering while protecting the natural environment and eliminating the risk of downstream flooding from these lands through the provision of the agency mandated stormwater management facilities. Um, of note, um, we think that adding the lands uh, to the Greenbelt in the middle of the ongoing municipal and conservation authority studies is, is just not good planning and could prematurely preclude the most suitable location for expanded settlement areas. Um, the, the region of Durham is undertaking their MCR as has been discussed tonight. Um, and there's a, there's a, with the ERO request, um, they have certainly responded, and that was noted by Mr. McCullough, that 
the, um, the region and the city of Pickering have made it quite clear they don't want these lands included at this time until that study can be completed. And we certainly echo those thoughts. We believe that um, inclusion of them based on a, a draft watershed plan that hasn't had full review and finalization while these studies are going on is inappropriate. There's a lot more to consider um, when looking at whether these areas should go in the green belt or whether they should be used for development under the provincial policy statement, under the growth plan, under the green belt plan. Um, and all of those things are what the region is doing right now and what the city of Pickering will be looking at in terms of an appropriate form of development. Um, so it, I think in summary, um, you know, when I was sorry, there's one more point there that one of the bigger, um, I think, issues that we've seen with the, um, the watershed plan, and Mayor Collier had mentioned this, was um, the assumption that there would be no management of stormwater of any kind uh, while the scenarios were proceeding. We obviously think that um, they have to revise that and include a scenario that would show an appropriate form of use there and would have the proper controls and model that scenario as they go forward. Um, that is the appropriate uh, option that is not included in the subwatershed set right now. Um, so I think with that, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I think I'm available for any comments or questions uh, you may have of me, but certainly the overture uh, I have um, to you tonight is to consider um, not including 2A in, in your motion and adoption of the, of the report um, to allow the, the comprehensive review process to continue and finish and to allow a comprehensive planning approach that takes into account um, the need to protect the natural heritage system, to provide for housing, to uh, promote and provide for jobs in the region and in Pickering to occur, and to balance all those in the public interest and the consideration prior to um, requesting the province or, or looking to have these lands in, put into the green belt. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cor Corey Wright. That's correct, uh, yeah. Chair Crawford. I have you, Sterling. Um, Mayor Collier first. Thank you, Madam Chair. To be fair, Sterling, I texted immediately when Mr. Corey started talking, so <laughs> I knew I was going to have questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Corey, for your delegation. Um, how many landowners are there in, in these white belt lands? Um, so we, we've submitted um, a, a schedule. We submitted a letter uh, through you, uh, Chair Crawford, uh, to Mayor Collier. We, we've submitted a letter um, uh, identifying the participating landowners in the landowners group. Um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six main landowners identified on that schedule. And their lands are shown for, for transparency and clarity in terms of where their holdings are within Northeast Pickering. Um, that letter, I believe, was circulated uh, by the clerks to committee. Um, there are, of course, other landowners in that area, uh, but I, I represent the, um, the landowners group that has formed, of course, and, and their work that's being conducted. And I obviously haven't had a chance to read that letter. So I will read that at, at some point over the next, uh, the next day or so. So I guess, can you tell me what percentage? I mean, are you here representing 20%, 80%? Uh, I should know this number off the top of my head. I'm just looking at the map again. I, I would hazard to say we're around 50% of the area, um, generally speaking, or if not a little less than that. You represent um, the area where the headwaters of the Carruthers are located. In right. parts. Through in, you, through you uh, Chair Crawford, yes, in parts. Okay. Is there any, according to your landowners group, is anybody suggesting that the headwaters should not be protected? Is there any argument there, or is that something that we can all agree that the headwaters of the Carruthers will not and should not be developed and should be protected? And, and through you, Chair Crawford, uh, indeed, as, as you mentioned, Mayor Collier, uh, you saw the Moraine plan that was put forward originally, um, and that provided uh, an analysis of the natural heritage system uh, or, or one version of a natural heritage system that would be uh, provided to protect all key natural heritage features and, um, and hydrological features. Um, I, I would say that using such an approach in the natural heritage system 
um, as, as noted in the staff report even, uh, uh, often provides a greater level of protection for those features than even the Greenbelt Plan does. Um, the city and the, the provincial policy statements protections around natural heritage systems are quite robust, um, both the city of Pickering and of course the town of Ajax is as well, but um, they provide a, a significant amount of protection and there is a commitment to properly identify that natural heritage system uh, working together with the TRCA, local municipalities, the region, and have that properly designated and protected throughout any eventuality of, of future development process. So, okay. Um, so thank you for that. What do the landowners group feel about who should pay for any studies that need to be done, like the updating of the environmental assessment that the town of Ajax paid for back in 2010 that needs updating? for the hydrological studies, for any remediation me measures that may come out of this and ongoing long-term maintenance that Councillor Dye spoke about during her questions. And, because and this, this development does nothing for Ajax, but we are the ones who, and it's been proven, I don't think you can argue, are they gonna be the ones that are gonna have the potential um, issues. Well, again, through you, uh, Madam Chair, um, that's certainly something I can take back to the landowner group. I know they're certainly um, willing to and always um, uh, eager to have discussions and, and to both with you and your council, as well as with the city of Pickering. Um, that being said, the information I have from the technical consultants, I'm just the planner in this case, I'm not doing the engineering work, um, is that they believe that they can mitigate uh, downstream, any downstream flood risk from any of the development that will occur here. Um, and that, you know, it, that sounds strange when you consider it against the, the statements made with the watershed plan. But that I'll also remind, uh, respectfully remind everyone on the call that the sub watershed plan assumed no stormwater management controls of any kind when the modeling was done, which, as you, I think, very correctly stated, Mayor Collier. Um, is not realistic. There would always be proper protections required. And, um, and uh, I, I would say even uh, more expeditiously and provided with certainty through a development process as opposed to otherwise. Um, so that uh, I can certainly take back those comments. It's the first I'm, um, I'm personally hearing of uh, the EA and I'm, I'm, I'm listening tonight hearing these comments and I'm very happy to take those back to the Leonard group and continue the conversation with you. Okay. Well, I did share that and had that discussion with one of the larger landowners last year when they applied for an MZO. And I believe we actually have a letter from them committing to um, some of those things, which was helpful. Um, I have seen the Varane plan. Um, uh, there's a couple of things that, that do benefit us. There's, there's the 407 interchange at Wesley and the 407 interchange at Salem, which will benefit our industrial parks. But the, the headwater lands are nicely protected and it's a lot of parkland, but I did suggest to that landowner, why don't they voluntarily through this Greenbelt consultation offer to have those lands included in the green belts. Take them off the table. And then motions like this and anything that might come and, and frustrate the process for the group going forward isn't necessarily that much of a problem because those of us like the town of Ajax are protected. What are your thoughts on that? And have you had that discussion? And, and through you, Madam Chair, um... We, we certainly had thoughts on that and we have discussed it amongst the group. <clears throat> I think the, the resounding um, feeling and, and, and desire is that we continue to resolve exactly those kinds of questions through completing the studies that the TRCA is doing, completing the studies that the region is doing and completing the work that we're doing um, to determine the right areas to, to be protected. I, I will say that I do believe it's, it's not appropriate in general for any of the white belt land to be included in the green belt until all the studies that have been are required to be done, especially to implement the growth plan to the 2051 targets have been completed um, because it, the plans function together. 
the, the growth plan and the Greenbelt plan were always designed and intended to be um, delivered together. And the White Belt was always intended to be the other area that growth could occur if new growth had to occur, um, which is why in my experience and, and personal history with it, um, those lands were not included in the Green Belt in the first place. And I think that principle still applies in this case. And that's not to say that development is, that's, and there's no license there for development to occur in an inappropriate way. All of the appropriate planning and study will occur and has to occur prior to any development to ensure every consideration, including downstream flood uh, impacts, are addressed and mitigated. So I, I do believe, uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, to you, Mayor Collier, that um, the process will, will address those issues and needs to complete. And the inclusion of lands in the Greenbelt at this time is premature. And it doesn't also, uh, even if they don't enter the Greenbelt plan itself, preclude the protections that are afforded through the natural heritage system, which provides, in many ways, um, even more robust protection than the Greenbelt plan does itself. Well, I'll, I'll respectfully disagree on that one. Um, I have had lots of discussions with, with several people outside of, I guess, the landowner group, and that kind of goes against some of the discussions that I've had with, with whether they'd be willing to do that type of thing and, and work with us. And if, if I'm hearing that they're not willing to work with us and you'd rather just go ahead and do the study. And, and remember, I go back to, to Roper 128. I've been through all this the first time around in the last MCR. And I know these lands aren't even supposed to come on the table till end of 2020s into almost 2030s. But there's been an attempt to move them forward already last year with the, with the MZO request. So, um, you know, excuse me if I'm not just down with that, just for just from hearing it. I'm, I was trying to look for a compromise. Um, I, I prefer to pick fights I can win. Um, and and I, I saw this as a pretty decent compromise that in speaking with some of the people affiliated, I, I thought they thought it was an okay compromise as well. And that was going to be my, my suggestion, but um, I think not now, but I, I thank you for answering my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Regional Councillor Lee. You're muted, Sterling. You are <laughs> muted. I was just thanking you all for your patience. It's been a long evening as evidence. Um, to the um, proponent question. Um, so, I mean, let's not beat around the bush. Uh, it's one of your biggest uh, landowners is Dorsey. And it just, for me, it just, there's a certain sense of disingenuousness of, that's not even a word, but you get what I'm saying, of um, this group saying, we want to work with uh, conservation authorities. We want to work with uh, municipalities. When, you know, July last year, there was an MZO on the table that absolutely would have ignored um, all these things that we're doing now. So now it's come time for the province to ask us for comments. And now, um, this group, which, you know, it, I, I guess it was just Dorsey that asked for the MZO, not the entire group. But now it's just like, oh, no, no, we have to follow, let's follow the procedures. Follow. That's, that's, that's a very hard pill for me to swallow, especially sitting on regional council where, you know, we just resoundingly said no to the MZO request. So um, I, that, it's just more of a comment than really a question. But I'm just, you know, do this 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 desire to be part of this the, the conversation now I, like i i just I, I question just how genuine that is and you know you you made a statement of just like um there be um protections to mitigate flooding but if that doesn't happen then ajax has no core recourse if if i'm uh, is that correct like if if somehow your best plans have still led to immense flooding uh south and it's impacted our municipality we we have no oversight of that if i'm not correct if, if i'm correct uh, through you madam chair uh, uh yeah i would i would like to respond to those uh comments the um i'll say this there's a, a, being a, on, on regional council um uh, you'll appreciate this there's an incredibly lengthy and robust planning process that has to unfold um, uh, under the growth plan prior to even bringing lands into the settlement boundary, regardless of whether they're, they're zoned already or not, 
there's still a requirement that the subwatershed study be the watershed study be updated and completed. Um, that's a fundamental requirement to bring them into the settlement boundary, and that will always would have happened in any event of this going forward, and still has to happen. Um, there is also then following that an entire secondary plan process that has to unfold to then refine that and drill down to a, a greater level of detail with better science and on the ground information to determine what uh, and can happen while maintaining the principles and the requirements that have been established in the subwatershed study and the higher level studies to even consider the land for inclusion into the settlement area boundary. And, and the only reason I, I walk you through all that, this is, this is like another six to eight years almost of study in some cases prior to any development occurring to ensure that the proper controls will be there, that everything will be delivered. These are all public processes. They're all processes that everyone, including the town, can be involved with and will be involved with. And there is full transparency on both the work that's being done and the approvals that will be granted through that whole process. Um, when when I, I want to clarify, when we're saying we want to work with, with you all, it's, it's through all of those processes and to get to those conclusions to address all the concerns that have to be addressed. And doing all that work is the right thing to do. It's the process that the regional official plan or regional council has mandated. It's the, pro it's the process the province has mandated. And it's the process that the city of Pickering will follow in consultation with all their neighbors, including the town of Ajax. So when we say we want to work through that process, it was always anticipated. I know from speaking with uh, Dorsey themselves, but also now for the larger landowner group, understanding that all that has to unfold and that all of that will unfold. And it, the, the question here is, can it unfold or not? And the the issue is that if the lands are put into the green belt, that process is precluded completely. Like any discussion on it, any alternative of doing development potentially is precluded. Um, and even trying to nail down um, as, as uh, through you, Madam Chair, that Mayor Collier was, was mentioning certain areas that could be put in now, it, it's hard to do that until those processes are finished. And that is the that is what we're talking about when we're talking about working together and working towards a solution here and not precluding different options. But so ultimately, I, sorry, if I may, if that MZO was granted, then all these things that you just described, you technically did not have to follow through with all of them. Am I, am I incorrect in stating that? Uh, through, you, Madam Chair, that specifically. Through, through you, Madam Chair, I, I, I believe you are incorrect on that with respect, uh, just because you, they would still need a settlement area expansion that has to be processed by the region. They would still need a secondary plan to proceed to development. Zoning does not give you amendments to the official plans. So it, it, those things would still have to happen and it would still go forward. Okay. You know what? That's fine. Um, I, I've obviously been given a very different impression of what an MZO entails, especially since we've just been burnt by another one um, just south there. So uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll say, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to express my, fr my frustration with this and this process. And, you know, I, I, I agree we should be going through a very set process. And I think this is a very, the province asked for our input and we are just uh, giving it uh, to the, to what we think is what's best for the municipality. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chair. Is there any other questions or comments to Mr. Corey? If not, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank and you so much for hearing me. Give, yeah, get, taking time to uh, give us your delegation tonight. So Mr. Clerk, if I'm not mistaken, we can come back to comments from council uh, or the recommendation, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, the recommendations are before you. It was moved by Councillor Dyes and seconded by Councillor Lee, Regional Councillor Lee. Uh, Regional Councillor Dyes. You're on mute. Joanna. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're never going to get it right. Okay. Just a couple of things I wanted to comment on that came out through conversation you know we talk about process and how development goes through process but the town also has gone through a significant process 
with the issues surrounding the headwaters of the Crothers. And we recognized, as I said previously, that there was a spill area that we needed to, to address. We um, had TRCA look at it further and paid for, uh, for an EA on that. It came back with, with uh, a more firm boundary of the urban spill and um, the recommendation of the land form, which we knew we would be responsible for. And I say this because we know through development North Ajax, we've created these issues. We know more now. We know what the impacts are when you start to build along these urban river valleys, if you want to call them that, these creeks. And so as you go further up and, and, and up and up and up you go, of course, that's going to exacerbate the problem even more. And then it takes it into Pickering where it will become their problem as well. And I always pull out this report from TRCA where they looked at a flood remediation area in an area where they had um, one of the worst areas of flooding and it's in Black Creek basically. So here you, you have a creek that over decades has been built upon all the way down. And all of a sudden you have a lot of flooding problems and re remediation work to do and they had to study it. The cost of the study was 2.9 million. But the mitigation for these flooding issues amounted to $57 million, which is paid for by the taxpayers because the developers, yes, they put the stormwater infrastructure in and the water management ponds, but guess what? They start to fail. And we know we even have to dredge our stormwater management ponds and it's very expensive. So as you know, infrastructure fails, it has to be replaced and then new technology comes along and it improves that too. So the costs are astronomical in some cases and where there's bridges, of course, replacements and bends in river that wash out and they need to be reinforced and it goes on and on and dredging and there's a whole bunch of issues. So we've been consistent here in Ajax. We know the mistakes. We, we know that it's dangerous to keep um, building on the headwaters of any creek, particularly here because of the flow down into the old area that has a history of flooding and it would exacerbate it even more. So the other thing I wanted to talk about too was, <laughs> you know, we had this MZO on the headwaters of the Crother Creek prior to, you know, the region completing their work on their comprehensive review prior to the land needs assessment being completed. So it's okay for the landowners to do that, but we're inappropriate in doing that now. And what we are doing is just responding to the provinces, um, growing the green belt and putting it out there, asking for people to comment on what they would like to see. And um, it was a no brainer really <laughs> here in Ajax that that would be a huge, it's a huge ask, of course, because we know it's owned by developers who, who are already in the midst of, of planning what they want, even though it's in the white belt, not to be built till 2051. So, you know, I think it's important that we, we send the right information to the province that this is a problem and, and not just for flooding, we need to protect our creeks for many, many reasons, but you know, we also know what quality of water means here in Ajax. And I think you wanna preserve that for your generations to come. Um, I guess that's about it. The only other issue, you know, if you, I have with this is the leapfrogging, if the white belt is developed on the headwaters, the infrastructure and how you get that infrastructure from, you know, through, the green belt to this little island of white belt, which is extremely expensive as well. And nobody ever talks about that. I know that the developers promise to work with us now, but they once their their you know subdivisions are completed and families are living there, they're long gone. And uh, it's really left up to us to manage that. And I think right now during COVID, we have a really strong appreciation for our green spaces and not to mention our agricultural lands, as you've seen in the US, you know, our, our um, neighbors to the south are not always a friendly neighbor. And I think it's important when you have prime one agricultural lands that you use them to feed your population. So those are just a few of my comments and, and just thank you again to staff for putting forward the report. I really appreciate it. And I hope that we can, uh, just a suggestion, put the information 
of the timeline of April 19th on IMO with some information as to how to get on the ERO for the public to do that, because I know that many people are, are um, watching and, and still support our efforts to get this included in the green belt. So they, they'd like to comment on that. Thank you. Okay, is there any uh, Sterling, uh, Regional Councilor Lee? Always sterling to you, Chair. Um, just very quickly, um, I just want to echo what uh, Councillor Dyes eloquently said. I mean, I agree with all of it. Um, ultimately, I want to go back to actually what uh, Mayor Collier said of just, this. these are just recommendations. The final call is still going to, going to go to the province. This is the same province that, you know, Bill 229 got at the Conservation, Conservation Authority Act, Bill 257 threw in MZO powers for a broadband bill. So ultimately, I'm not even that hopeful they're gonna to listen to us, to be honest. So I, I, I'm i gonna shoot for the moon, uh, just like Councillor Dyes said, and we're gonna ask for as much as we can uh, to to uh, protect not only the environment, but what I think are Ajax's best interests. So uh, happy to happy that staff really put forth this recommendation as aggressively as it seems. And I just hope, you know, through some horseshoes chance that uh, the province listens uh, to our recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Any other comments? So the recommendation is before us. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? That passes. Okay, I think we are at adjournment. And I have a motion from Mayor Collier, seconded by Lisa Bauer, uh, that uh, this meeting be adjourned. Sorry, Madam Any Chair. Can I speak to that motion for a second, please? <laughs> no, I have questions. To you staff cannot. Voter. I have questions. To staff. There are no wanna, questions. I just want to say um, before we adjourn, <laughs> I want to wish everybody, or wish Marilyn a happy birthday tomorrow. Oh. And to everybody that's her birthday tomorrow. So. Yay, happy, happy birthday, birthday Marilyn. Marilyn. <laughs> Thankfully, more. everybody has gone home now and turned us off. <laughs> If Thank they were you very here, much. Good Let's keep you. going. Good night, everyone. Night. Good night, everybody. All in favor? All in favor. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> good night, everyone. Thank you good very night, much. Everybody. Good night, everyone.